Click on the subscribe button to subscribe to our channel. Press the bell icon on the YouTube app and never miss another update. How many of you have written this examination? Paper two? Please put up your hands. Just one? In this entire class? Two? Okay. Just two? Okay. Just two? Anyone else? Okay. Just one? Just two? Anyone else? No one else. Okay. Anyone who intended to intended to write the examination but could not because they did not get through prelims. <laughs> you guys can joke about it. Now, so, oh yeah, it's all kind of paper. So, now, what can I do? You always learn to take it in your own way. So, <clears throat> before I start the discussion for uh, the question which I've been asked, I think uh, this year. I feel that relatively the general studies paper have been much simpler and have been much rooted in theory and thora fundamentals ke upar zyada focus kiya UPSC na as you would have realized they have asked questions on the financial emergency they have asked questions on parliamentary committees right so questions which could have been answered by anyone who would have read lakshmi kant so the question which comes to mind is that is lakshmi kant enough or sufficient and a straight simple answer to that is no if you are looking for shortcuts if you think that you know that's the way to get through the examination that's not going to work so lakshmi kant is not sufficient let me put it very clear lakshmi kant can only help you to a certain extent it will help you build the concepts of your constitution indian polity indian political systems etc but you need to top it up with things from current affairs whatever knowledge whatever understanding you gain from the daily reading of the newspapers in fact you know there there are some really interesting questions also which they framed this year there was this question which was there on environmental uh, you know uske upar unhone question banaya i don't know what's the question number it's uh, that is yeah concept sixth right policy contradictions among various competing sectors and stakeholders have resulted in inadequate protection and prevention of degradation to environment comment with relevant illustrations now this question can be answered completely if you've been reading the newspapers consistently and this also this question should also answer those queries when people come and ask ki sir humne isse vision aaya iske current affairs notes pad liye या इस फलाफला इंस्टीट्यूट के हमने करंट अफेयर नोट्स पढ़ लिए आर दे सफिशियंट टू प्रिपेयर फॉर करंट अफेयर दंसर इज नो बिकॉज इफ यू वुड हैव गॉन थ्रू एनी ऑफ द कंपाइलेशन यू वुड नॉट हैव गॉट ऑल द इशूज ऑफ वेर एवर एनवायरमेंट हैज कम इन कॉन्फ्लिक्ट विद एनी डिसीजन पॉलिसी डिसीजन विच हैज बीन टेकन बाय द गवर्नमेंट वेदर इट इज विद रिस्पेक्ट टू माइनिंग whether it is with respect to the national parks whether it is with respect to whatever was happening in tutikorin whatever are the issues you would not have got a compilation of them at one place so therefore reading newspapers is the most important part of your preparation for paper 2 one second is lakshmi kant has to be your base you need to revise it you need to really know it by heart now as upsc has made it very clear in two three questions this year you need to know lakshmi kant by heart financial emergency ka kya conditions hai financial emergency hone ke upar kya hota hai or with respect to the institution of the cag what are the various conditions which are there with respect to his appointment his or her appointment what are the various safeguards which are there all of these things if you don't know them and all of them are mentioned very clearly in lakshmi kant you will be finding it very tough to answer and the thing is that you cannot write generic things you cannot write generic answers it is after all a polity governance paper you need to write constitution provisions of the constitution you need to mention some judgments of the supreme courts which are important you need to mention some schemes of the government you need to mention whatever policy decisions which have been taken by the government in your answers generic answers will not give you marks 
and this is also something which a lot of aspirants have been coming and saying ki sir paper agar mushkil aata to humme help hoti because we were well prepared and everything and all of that i don't believe in that i believe that whether it is easy or whether it is difficult a good student a good aspirant will always be able to showcase that what extra as they have over the others what i mean to say specifically here is that if क्वेश्चन आए एस्टिमेट्स कमेटी के ऊपर या कमेटी के ऊपर यू ट्राई टू ड्रॉ सम रेलेवेंट एग्जांपल्स यू ट्राई टू राइट अबाउट सम पर्टिकुलर आर्टिकल्स ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन सम जजमेंट्स ऑफ सुप्रीम कोर्ट और एनीथिंग यू विल बी गेटिंग दोस एक्स्ट्रा वन वन एंड हाफ मार्क्स एंड जिस तरीके का इस बार पेपर थे ऑलमोस्ट एवरीवन वी हैव बीन हियरिंग हैज अटेम्प्टेड 19 20 क्वेश्चंस ऑलमोस्ट एवरीवन हैज डन दैट सो नॉलेज वाजंट दैट बिग अ बैरियर दिस टाइम व्हेन इट केम कम्स टू क्वेश्चंस earlier what they used to have was they would have like one or two three questions which would be unattemptable right this year if you look at all the 20 questions all of them are attemptable there is nothing about them which is not attemptable so what is going to make the difference the difference is not going to be in that who attempted that 20th or 19th question and got those six or seven extra marks the difference is going to be who could get one mark extra in each and every question and how do you extract that out of the examiner is what you need to learn since you people aspire to write the examination next year it's very important that you should start preparing yourself in that particular manner only you should start preparing yourself in that particular you should take yourself through that process where you know that what is expected by the examiner what is going to give me that half or one mark extra over the other candidate so try to focus on those aspects and whatever i say here apart from that i believe the best way to prepare for the upsc examination is to look at and to improve your answer writing is to look at the answers of the previous year topics right lot of people don't use it mai bar 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 us baat ko repeat karta rehta hu that it is a very important aspect of answer writing please look at the answers written by the previous year topics that will give you an immense idea clarity on what is to be written in your answers to secure those extra marks from the exam one is that now another thing which i wanted to sort of discuss here was that see all the question there are 12 question which are there of quality in governance which i am going to discuss except maybe two or three there were hardly any question which were not expected hardly I remember taking the last class of the mains 365 batch for quality, and I had said that these are the topics which I feel are important. And उसके अंदर maximum में समझ आ गया. And it's not that मैंने कोई predict कर दिया that I am you know uh, that I could predict it and anyone else could not. Anyone could have predicted those. They were so predictable. So the paper this year in terms of topics, the issues which UPSC touched was very predictable, and therefore. answer writing becomes even more important because unpredictable issues aate hain topics aate hain to jo veterans hote hain or people those who are well read gain an advantage over the others but when it comes to something which is very predictable evm ke upar issue was all over the newspapers the issue between the tussle the tussle between the lg and the delhi government was all over the newspapers or you talk about any any you know topic uh, any issue which you pick up in this ये नेशनल कमीशन फॉर शेड्यूल कास्ट के ऊपर जो क्वेश्चन है सेकंड क्वेश्चन दैट वाज आल्सो देयर देयर वाज अ कंट्रोवर्सी व्हिच हैड कम अप व्हेन द चीफ मिनिस्टर ऑफ यूपी वेंट ऑन टू से दैट यू नो देयर शुड बी रिजर्वेशन फॉर द शेड्यूल कास्ट आल्सो इन द रिलीजियस माइनॉरिटी इंस्टीट्यूशंस सो देयर वर आर्टिकल्स ऑन दैट पर्टिकुलर एस्पेक्ट फाइनेंस कमीशन ऑब्वियसली एवरीवन वुड हैव एक्सपेक्टेड अ क्वेश्चन ऑन फाइनेंस कमीशन सो इंस्टेड ऑफ डिस्कसिंग टू मच अबाउट कंटेंट what should have gone into your answers what should not have gone into your answers we'll try to discuss more in terms of what you could have done in order to extract that extra mark from the examiner what should have been the structure structuring becomes dekho jab bhi paper aasan hoga ya jab bhi sabke liye same similarity level aa jayega difference will not be content please understand that because every one of you is reading the same content every one of you is reading the same book there is nothing different but what is going to make the difference is that how well you have absorbed that book and secondly how well you are able to translate 
that whatever knowledge what you have absorbed from that book or from that piece of article in the newspaper on to the piece of paper and therefore structuring how you write your conclusion how you interpret the question all of these things have become very important this year very important the difficulty level in terms of content has gone down but the difficulty level in terms of expression has gone significantly up because everyone will be writing the same thing so therefore you need to make sure that your answer stands out from the other person and it will not be by writing some innovative ideas in the paper you need to write a well structured answer with relevant examples with relevant illustrations with relevant articles of the indian constitution supreme court judgments etc i am repeating it again and again the reason is because these are the things which are going to make the difference this year believe me and this year you will see a lot of first timers actually cracking through this examination the success rate will be better as compared to the previous years is what my understanding is main paper 2 ke bare mein specially keh sakta hu because the paper this year was simpler but it required more application application zyada tha paper ke andar how you apply yourself in those three hours right so as far as sources for paper 2 are concerned right first is polity usko acche se aapko pad lena hai you need to read it as you know properly as possible if you want to make notes of topics which you are not confident of make notes do whatever but read it really well one is that second aspect comes to that whatever part of the whatever you know you are reading in the lakshmi kant try to get some relevant judgments of supreme court or the high courts on those particular issues if there are any say for example tribunals this year the question on tribunals if you would have known some of the judgments of supreme court on tribunals you would have been able to easily answer that question otherwise wo question jo hai wo bahut generic answer aap koi bhi likh sakte hai uske andar but how do you extract those extra marks you need to know certain judgments of supreme court so you and you need to go and do that research on your own there is no book which is available there are thousands of judgments which are there you need to find one or two important relevant judgments with respect to each and every provision which you are reading right and the third thing is arc this year is very important arc has come back into prominence this year you can answer at least three to four questions easily if you have read some parts of arc but does that mean that you read the entire arc the answer is no what you should do is what i have always been repeating all these years that whenever you have to read a particular topic especially governance ke topics jo hain aapke paper 2 ke syllabus mein mentioned hai you try to identify what are the various dimensions of that particular topic for example if there is e governance what is e governance why e governance what are the case studies of e governance successful examples of e governance in india challenges of e governance in india what can be further done with e governance over and above what we are already doing in e governance space in india so you need to frame these questions first and try to find answers through arc by selective reading of the arc not a cover to cover reading i hope i am able to explain myself here is everyone able to understand what i am trying to say yes hmm? oh what is arc okay so theek hai nahi it's okay so the government of india set up second administrative reform commission okay it came out with a set of reports i think there were 14 or 15 reports which were there they came out with these thick reports which no one pays heed to right no one has ever read them except upsc civil service aspirants right that's true no one has because if someone would have read them then something would have been changed in this country right so kuch hua nahi so second arc is that okay so first administrative reform commission was set up in the 1960s the second one was set up in the late 2000s okay so the second administrative reform commission came out with its reports in various areas whether it is public order whether it is rti whether it is e governance different aspects of governance in india and it suggested reforms it analyzed the issues what are the problems what are the challenges what is the status of things as of now and what are the suggestions or what are the recommendations 
which are needed to be implemented to improve the status quo. Okay, so that is what second ARC was. Now, second ARC ki report ki summaries bahut sari available hai market ke andar. Please don't go through them. I always recommend against reading them because I know how they have been prepared. Un mein se kuch jo summaries hai, wo maine hi banai hai. To mujhe pata hai, wo kaise banai hai. Thik hai. So, what I am trying to basically say is that those summaries are not useful at all. Because they don't give you the complete picture. Bahut sara important content missing hai. Wo bahut jaldi mein banai gaya hai, wo sab ka. तो बहुत सारा इंपॉर्टेंट कंटेंट मिसिंग है सम इंपॉर्टेंट सम इरेलेवेंट कंटेंट इज देयर सो देयर फोर इफ यू हैव टू रीड द एआरसीज प्लीज एंश्योर दैट यू पिक अप टॉपिक्स फ्रॉम सिलेबस फ्रेम क्वेश्चंस अराउंड इट व्हिच गिव्स अ 360 डिग्री कवरेज टू दैट एंटायर टॉपिक ट्राई टू फाइंड आंसर्स टू दोस क्वेश्चंस फ्रॉम द सेकंड एआरसी एंड योर टॉपिक वुड बी प्रिपेयर्ड से फॉर एग्जांपल सिटीजन चार्टर व्हाट इज अ सिटीजन चार्टर what are the objectives of citizen charter what is the history of citizen charter in india what are the exact you know the existing status of citizen charter in india what are the challenges which have been faced in the implementation of the citizen charter in india what are the recommendations which have been made by the second arc now to improve the implementation of citizen charter so you frame these six questions try to find six seven points for each of these questions your notes would be prepared you would be prepared forever for the topic of citizen charter This is one of the easiest questions to answer. Whenever we talk about polity, mains 365 ki class mein, usse pehle bhi, whenever I have talked about that topic, I have always said that there are some five, six basic elements of citizen charter which you need to keep in mind while you are answering a question in UPSC. Right? There is not nothing rocket science about. It. The only thing is that now once you have looked that content, how do you put it on paper? That's the most important. Right? So that is one thing. If some of you are interested in reading some aspects of constitution specifically, constitution specifically, and some aspects of governance, you can refer the book on Indian public administration, public administration in India, issues and challenges. ऐसे कुछ करके मैं रजनी गोयल ने रोना. Again, please do not think I am saying that go and buy that book. I am saying you can refer if you have time, if you have interest. and if you have the bandwidth to understand that book it's a very good book very comprehensively written the only problem is very exhaustive it's used by students of public administration for paper 2 preparation maybe any of your friends those who are having that book because they are having public administration optional get it from them maybe get some of the relevant pages photo stack right unko kuch pages ko aap xerox karwa lijiyega but there's no need to buy the book as such but it is one book which i would say is perhaps the most definitive book which is there on polity constitution and governance area for india otherwise uske alawa kahin pe bhi analysis available nahi analysis is hardly available anywhere else another another resource or source which you can use is the report of ncrwc national commission for reviewing the working of the constitution again please refer to it in parts please pay attention to the word refer all of you must either be graduates or students of graduation and you would understand what you mean by refer if you don't understand it go back to your professors and ask them what means what do you understand by refer you need to know what is refer by this age it is expected when you people are aspiring to get into the ias aspiring to get into ips irs whatever top service of the country that you know what what it means to refer so refer these books refer these texts refer these reports don't make them text text will remain to be lakshmi kant but reference ke liye aapko reports ko use karna hai theek hai and then most importantly reading newspapers on a daily basis making newspaper notes is not required it's a waste of time in my opinion maybe what you can do is that try to frame questions out of the newspaper every day one or two questions you can go to these websites etc which have these questions but i again feel that you know wahan pe bhi ek thoda sa uh, you know they are not the best at times so what you should do is that you should frame questions on your own something has come today in the newspaper try to frame a question on your own and write answer to that question that will be your notes 
and that will give you answer writing practice that will give you revision that will help you consolidate your knowledge as well that is the way to prepare a new psc and that is the way to prepare your newspaper items on a daily basis uske alawa monthly compilation to aati hai aap usko refer karte rahiyega chhota mota jo you know some things come you can maybe note them up you should definitely have a notebook to write down some important things which you feel you will forget or which might not be covered in the monthly current affairs magazine you write it down in your notebook and or maybe there is some really important or nice editorial which has been written some really uh, eminent person someone who who's a definite authority on law who is a definite authority in public policy etc has written something you maybe make a summary of that particular editorial or what you do don't ab wo cutting cutting ke sab zamane chale gaye hain you have ever notes you have one notes you have all the tools available why to waste energy pehle usko pehle baith ke kaat rahe hain फिर उसको चिपका रहे हैं कहीं पे राइट सो डोंट वेस्ट एनर्जी ऑन ऑल ऑफ दीज थिंग्स राइट यू कैन ऑल डू ऑल ऑफ इट ऑनलाइन सो एंड इट्स इजियर आल्सो दैट वे यू विल बी एबल टू जस्ट कट कॉपी पेस्ट देयर एंड यू कैन कट कॉपी पेस्ट द रेलेवेंट पार्ट्स आल्सो यू यू डोंट नीड टू कॉपी द एंटायर आर्टिकल एज़ वेल राइट सो ऑल दीज थिंग्स आर देयर यूज देम इफेक्टिवली राइट सो नाउ लेट्स बिगिन विद द डिस्कशन ऑन दिस यू नो पर्टिकुलर पेपर जनरल स्टडीज पेपर 2 ऑफ यूपीएससी 2000 18 the first question which was there was regarding the evm controversy which has been there right it it has all it, it has been all over the newspapers etc the question was very simple and you need to understand that you have just 150 words 10 marks round about 6 to 7 minutes to answer this question so keep that in mind as well when you go back today your attempt should be aapko ye kisi ek purpose se diya gaya hai माय सजेशन विल बी कि आप इस को जाके आप इसको जब ये जगह दी गई है ये ये ऐसी सुंदरता बढ़ाने के लिए नहीं दी गई है ठीक सो प्लीज गो एंड राइट योर ओन आंसर एंड राइट इट विद इन दिपुलेटेड टाइम डोंट डू इट एट योर ओन लिबर्टी कि पहले एक लाइन लिखी फिर मम्मी ने बुला लिया चाय पी रहे हैं फिर फिर एक और लिख रहे हैं डोंट डू दैट राइट इट विद इन द स्टिपुलेटेड टाइम राइट इट विद इन दो सिक्स सेवन मिनट राइट इन राइट इट विद इन द वर्ल्ड लिमिट अभी कम से कम एग्जामिनेशन हॉल के बाहर हो तो तब तो अपने को टेस्ट करो जितना चैलेंज कर सकते हो ट्राई टू चैलेंज योरसेल्फ कि 150 वर्ड्स में ही लिखना है इसका आंसर नॉट इवन अ सिंगल वर्ड मोर आई हैव टू ट्राई टू एक्सप्रेस माय सेल्फ इन 150 वर्ड्स ओनली ट्राई टू चैलेंज योरसेल्फ आउटसाइड द एग्जामिनेशन हॉल एटलीस्ट व्हाट हैपेंस इन एग्जामिनेशन हॉल इज डिफरेंट थिंग यू हैव अ लॉट ऑफ प्रेशर लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स आर देयर यू नो थिंग्स आर हैपनिंग यू देयर इज सो मच व्हिच इज हैपनिंग अराउंड यू दैट इट्स डिफिकल्ट टू कंट्रोल थिंग्स but at least when you are outside the examination hall once you go back today this entire class and this entire endeavor on our part would be useless if you people just come sit here ye asaram babu ka pravachan nahi hai ki i come here i say something in the new guys go back and then just sleep over it please ensure that you put whatever we are discussing here to best knowledge to best use you go back try to write your answers and that's why i asked also that who are the people who failed prelims you, it should wo lagna chahiye yahan pe you should feel that that nahi hua tha upsc did not give us the chance to write the mains but we will ensure that we have enough practice whether or not we wrote it in the examination hall or not so please ensure that you write yahan pe sirf roz aaj teen din abhi ye yahan pe chal raha hai event aur isko hum रोज आएंगे यहाँ पे बैठ जाएंगे थोड़ी देर और फिर वापस घर पे जाके सो जाएंगे ऐसे मत करना प्लीज गो बैक एंड राइट आंसर्स विद इन द स्टेपुलेटेड टाइम विद इन द स्टेपुलेटेड वर्ड लिमिट इफ यू डोंट डू दैट यू विल बी एटॉस द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज इन लाइट ऑफ द रिसेंट कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी रिगार्डिंग द यूज ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉनिक वोटिंग मशीन वॉट आर द चैलेंजेस बिफोर द इलेक्शन कमीशन ऑफ इंडिया टू इंश्योर द ट्रस्ट वर्दीनेस ऑफ इलेक्शन इन इंडिया so the question i first would want to ask you people when it says that in the light of the controversy which has happened regarding the evm what are the challenges before the election commission of india to ensure the trustworthiness of elections in india now first tell me and please put up your hands what do you think this this question is about is this question about evms yes or no how many of you think this question is about evms Put up your hands. Those who think this question is about EVMs, okay, great. 
this question is not about EVMs. We are all agreeing on that particular aspect. So what is this question about then? Yes, trustworthiness of elections. What are the challenges which are being faced by the Election Commission of India in ensuring trustworthiness of elections? EVM being one part of it, right? That the trustworthiness around EVMs is one part. But there are other challenges as well and you need to talk about them. And what are the challenges? It does not say, and you need to read the language of the question. It says, what are the challenges? It does not talk about, suggest solutions, give suggestions, discuss the challenges. It asks simply, what are the challenges? In light of the controversy, that means, EVM controversy happened. After that, a larger question has come up. What is the trustworthiness of the biggest democratic exercise in this country? And what are the challenges which are there in front of the body which is supposed to ensure that that exercise happens in the most free and fair manner? That is what the question is. Right? Is it clear? Try to understand, there can be multiple interpretation which you can draw out of this question the moment you see this question. Oh, EVM. So I'll write, start writing about EVM. Trustworthiness of elections. Election Commission of India, none. You need to understand all the three issues are related. Election Commission of India, what is its role, what is its mandate will come into power in, in, in the answer somehow. Not explicitly but implicitly. The trustworthiness of elections, what are the challenges and in this you have to, one of the challenges also remains to be the EVM issue. Is this clear? Now once this, so this is what you should come into your mind the moment you see the question. You should get this interpretation in your mind in the first place. <coughs> These are the three, four things which I need to talk about. Election Commission of India, how, what are the challenges which it is facing in ensuring the trustworthiness of elections and in that I have to cover some aspect of EVM also. These are the three, four key words which should come to your mind and which you should keep in mind while writing your answer. Right? So, first, let's talk about what can be an introduction to this kind of question and mind you, this is just a 150 words answer. You don't have liberty to write a 25-30 word introduction. If you write that, rest of your content would already be gone and a conclusion will be It will become very difficult to write any content. So therefore, what will be the introduction? What can we please put up your hands and we will discuss that. What can be the possible introduction? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. So free and fair elections are signed to a non of a democracy, right? And the Election Commission of India is the body entrusted with this. There have been questions raised, right? This will be a long introduction. So you need to then compress it all. The Election Commission of India has been entrusted with the responsibility of ensuring free and fair elections, the cornerstone of any democracy. Some of the questions which have been raised in the recent times or some of the challenges which the Election Commission of India has faced in ensuring the trustworthiness of elections in favor in, in front of the citizens of the country are so and so. Right? So that could be one kind of introduction. What can be the other? Any other thing which comes to mind? Yes. Very good. Quote the constitution, the, art, the constitution under article 324 gives the power to the election commission of India to ensure free and fair elections in the country. In the recent time several controversies have come up including that of EVM where certain EVM machines were said to be not functioning properly. Ek button dabate hain, to bhi BJP ko jata hai, dousra dabate hain, to bhi BJP ko jata hai. Hey, bol <laughs> yeah, no, I am not saying this. Don't quote me. I am just saying this is what people were saying. Right? This was a controversy. Ki bhai kuch bhi dabao, hai. 
<laughs> so that that was the controversy which came up. Now, is that the only issue which is there? Then you need to write other issues. What else? Any other introduction which any one of you wants? Yes. Very good. Okay. So you know he's saying that it's not just that a process should be fair, but it should be trustworthy. I should know that what is happening. जब मैं वोट दे रहा हूँ, तो वो उसी पार्टी को जा रहा है। मेरे को ये ट्रस्ट होना चाहिए कि जब मेरी काउंटिंग और वोट्स होगी, it will be counted. So इसके अंदर आप सोच के देखो कि trustworthiness में क्या-क्या issues आते हैं। What are the issues which come, which make the elections in India un trustworthy or people do not trust them tell me what are those issues let's identify them and then the answer will fall into its place itself what are the issues which you think make elections in india less trustworthy it's brought out a very important point it's not just about fairness but trustworthiness of elections what what would you be mentioning here okay so one is ki bhai main jo button dabata hu usko vote jata hai Right, so there has to be some kind of, you know, verification for whoever, right, VVPAT or whatever. We'll talk about it. So EVM machines being one, that it's technology after all. It can be hacked. I don't know whether it can be hacked or not. There is possible that there is some bug which has been infused into it. Right, so that is one challenge. What else? Yes, booth capturing. Right, it is possible that some kind of booth capturing is happening or when the counting of the votes is happening at that point of time you know in fact yesterday uh, you know I just something very interesting came up uh, one of the officers in Nachal he uh, oh, ek machine, ek, uh, room tha, uske andar EVM machine rakhi hui thi aur uh, usme kuch bekar furniture bhi pada tha so very young officer just Two three years into service, what he did was that he is an SDM. He ordered that uh, you know, जो उसमें furniture है, वो room को खुलवा के वो furniture बाहर फेंकवा दो. That is lying idle there and already फेंकवा दो या something like that. So on this, someone made a recording and sent it to Election Commission of India. And Election Commission of India issued a notice. They said that you know the machines were lying there. Who gave you the power to unlock that particular room without our directions? Some you could have, you know, anything could have happened to those machines. Someone could have tampered with them, or anything could have been done, or whatever, right? So a notice was issued, and they recommended that this particular officer be suspended till further inquiry. So then the chief secretary intervened. He said, "Ki nahi, chalo, bacha hai, chhod do types and all that." Right? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> right. So. This is, this is something which happened and this is not I'm not cooking it up it just came across I came across this yesterday only anyway so booth capturing EVM what else what else ensures trustworthiness hey hey man bhai wo haath khada gaya bichara wahan haan haan ji okay so would that be trustworthiness of elections false propaganda etc would that be trust for the use of elections election process ki baat karo election commission of india kya kya cheez control kar sakta hai ek minute bhai wo haath khada gaya tha yes very good very important point electoral role that are the, the electoral roles being prepared in a proper manner aisa to nahi hai ki kisi ek particular community ko bahar rakh diya gaya कुछ पर्टिकुलर थिंकिंग के लोगों को आइडियोलॉजी के लोगों को बाहर रख दिया गया इलेक्टोरल रोल से हैज दैट बीन डन ट्रस्ट वर्दीनेस कम्स देयर राइट हैज एवरीवन हु वाज सपोज टू वोट गिवन अ वोटर आईडी कार्ड ऐसा तो नहीं कि 50 साल पहले मर गए उनका वोटर आईडी कार्ड अभी भी चल रहा है राइट सो हाउ व्हाट दिस इज वन अनदर चैलेंज इलेक्टोरल रोल्स यस वेरी गुड द appointment or the entire composition or the functioning of election commission of India is also something which 
will raise questions on trustworthiness of election commission and the election yes very good very good point right model code of conduct date of elections abhi recently another controversy came up ki kuch twitter handle ke upar pehle se hi release kar diya unhone they said that you know this is when the election dates are going to be election commission baad mein press conference kar raha tha right so these people knew before election commission of india one second thing could be that lot of times it has been alleged that the party in power holds the election commission of india to release to holds back the election commission of india to release the election dates so that they can make certain important policy announcements kyunki ek bar model code of conduct aa gaya then they won't be able to do that right so the when the model code of conduct kicks in or for example when the uh, election dates are announced right then there is no someone else who is controlling that entire aspect okay then apart from that you can yes yes so see yeah i mean we'll, we'll come to the solutions part a little later we just trying to identify what are the challenges which are the challenges being evm counting of votes challenges being who is voting challenges being that how the uh, booths are being managed how the security at the booths is being managed booth capturing etc is not happening certain people are not being stopped from casting their vote right lot of times it has been seen that bhai aapne time diya ki 9 se leke 5 baje tak voting hogi some people are not able to cast their vote right because of various reasons so that also raises questions on the trustworthiness of the entire issue right i do not trust this election system right so that is there then electoral rolls appointment and the functioning of the eci should be completely completely unbiased should be impartial yes i see a hand raised there so dekh kisne haath raise kiya tha expenditure monitoring of candidates then the use of money and muscle power right criminals entering into it and so and then another aspect could be that is a uh, is some kind of uh, undue advantage should not be given to those in power to the government in power right so all those aspects you can mention here the reason i am not mentioning all those is that these are the three four important ones and in a 150 word answer you can only mention five six and that also gets me to one question how many points we should write you need to think about it when you are framing the answer in your mind before writing out on the piece of paper so you should know that okay my introduction is going to be let's say 20 words and my conclusion is also going to be 20 25 words so i have 100 words left so if every point if i write even 15 words that is one sentence it means that i cannot write anything more than 5 to 6 points right but it will depend it will vary from question to question right that entire exercise would vary from question to question completely ho sakta hai kahin pe zyada points likhne ko ho kahin pe kam ho ho sakta hai kisi question mein do parts ho and you know one part very really well the other one you're not very sure so you know you if you know one part very really well you might just give one or two extra points in the other one part and the second part where you don't know so many points you might just write one or two points whatever you know it <coughs> it is possible that the examiner might still give you marks by looking at the overall answer rather than looking at the you know the objectively at each and every part it might happen it may or may not happen but there is a probability that it may happen considering that they might just you know look at one part and they say that okay this looks fine the second part is also looking fine so let me give marks overall that may or may not happen right there i saw a hand raised there yes yeah so i mean again you know appointment functioning structuring of election commission of india all of those aspects will come in here right so now see the thing is that there are two ways to answer this question one is you can ta start talking about role of election commission of india free fair trustworthy elections in india how, how they are sign qua non of you know uh, uh, of a democracy and then you basically talk about that these are some of the challenges which have come up in front of the election commission of india in the recent times in ensuring the trustworthiness of elections right 
or the other could be that you could start with talking about the EVM issue and how that has affected the trustworthiness of elections. And apart from that, there are some other challenges also which the ECI is facing or the EC is facing and these, these are some of the challenges. Once you are done with that, then you are left with 25-30 words of conclusion. So it's very important that your conclusion is ending the answer at a right note. Now if you see, conclusion is not asked. But somewhere you will have to conclude your answer. What are the challenges before the election commission of India? Now, in such a question where it is very explicitly mentioned, please I am telling you something very important. When it is explicitly mentioned what, there is no discuss, no comment, no examine, nothing. It means you keep your conclusion short. You know, don't unnecessarily force fit a conclusion into the answer. So it has to be very natural. And therefore a natural conclusion to this could be that in order to address some of the above challenges, Election Commission of India has taken some steps such as introduction of VV Pact. Right? Comma, so and so, comma, so and so and then you conclude your answer. It would not look like a forced conclusion. Deekho, ye baat samaj lo, conclusion likhna anivarre hai. It is important, it is necessary, it is not important, it is necessary. It is not something which is negotiable. You have to write it. But it should not feel like a forced thing into your answer. Therefore, in a question like this, where it is very explicitly asked what and not comment, discuss, analyze, examine, etc. and so and so forth. You should try to write a conclusion which is short and something which naturally fits into the answer. Are you getting it? Right? So some of the solutions which the EC has taken, you can write them. Or you can say that some of the solutions which can be taken by EC, anyway, you could write it. Right? Yes. Okay, so see that I would say that you know is not something which election commission can do much. Right? So what he's saying is that sir, can we change the FBTP to PR system? Uh, BSP and all of those issues. You're right. But the thing is that the question, that's why I said that, you know, keep these three things in mind. Election Commission of India ke ambit ke andar kya kya sakta hai, the challenges which they are facing. Otherwise, elections in India, the entire democratic exercise, etc. is a larger question. So try to restrict it to Election Commission of India as such. Largely. Okay. Another aspect in this could be appointment and functioning of ECI. In this you should also mention about the appointment of returning officers in the constituency etc. It should be done in the proper manner. Right? There should be no question over it. That Joby returning officer appoint hua hai, that person should not have any kind of wrong credentials. Right? He should be above all the doubts and suspicion. Because he is the most important person. He or she is the most important person ensuring the democratic exercise in the country. Right? So those aspects have to do. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. See, there are, again, I will tell you what. So that's why I said that there could be two interpretations of it. Obviously, the EVM aspect will get more weightage amount all your points. EVM aspect will get more weightage. But you this question cannot just be about EVM. I you know you're right that in light hai. Yes, so but how much focus, right? So let's say if we are writing five points, in this the EVM one, let's say agarap subkyo par bara bara pandra pandra words, this one should be 25 words. But you will have to bring in different dimensions as well in your answer. Because the question is not just that. You know, you're getting my point. So you are, and if you have to write the other points, if you have to write the answer on EVM, then you can write the answer on EVM. But since it says, what are the challenges overall as well in ensuring trustworthiness, you write about other aspects as well in your answer. Yes, yes, you should write that. Yes, yes. Through an open challenge, 
and then you know VVPAT is now being introduced. They are talking of bringing in a newer version of the EVM machines late in 2018, etc. They are already working on it. So you write those. That's why I said that later on in your answer you can write that. Yes, there was a one hand raised there. Yes. See, you can. I'll tell you what. So. Money power, muscle power, social media, fake news, these are all challenges which are being faced and these are very relevant challenges. But the only thing is, you will need to take a call that can I club them under one other, you will have to see them, okay. So, what do you do that the functioning of ECI, electoral process, is all one in one. The electoral role, uh, the appointment of the returning officer, all of them you make it one. Then you make all these issues around social media, fake news, money power, muscle power into one. But you will have to do it intelligently. Again, you know, th there are different things. There are different ways to answer it also. See, this is just one way. And this perhaps not would not be the most ideal way as well. So what you have said, you need to then club. And then you need to see that, okay, can I club two, three points, make it into one, so that I'm covering all the dimensions as well. But at the same time, I am not, you know, exceeding my word limit as well. So you will need to reorient your answer accordingly. If you have more ideas, you need to club them. That's the only way. Otherwise, you can write six, seven more points on this, right? But some point of time, you have to draw the line. Okay. Any doubts? Okay. So this was the first question. Second question: Whether national commission for scheduled cars can enforce the implementation? Up. See, agar aap fir se question dekho. Question ki language bahut simple. It says whether National Commission for Scheduled Cars can enforce the implementation of constitutional reservation for the scheduled cars in religious minority institutions examine. Now this is a question of the constitution. There is no opinion of yours which is sought here. They have just asked you whether this can be done or not. National Commission for Scheduled Cars so the question talks about National Commission for Scheduled Caste. You should know what are the roles and responsibilities and the ambit of the powers of National Commission for Scheduled Caste. You should also know that if the reservation has to be done in the minority educational, minority religious institutions, then who has the powers to do that? What are the ways to do that? And then what are the constitutional provisions around this, right? And you just need to examine this. There is no other need to talk about any other thing and so on and so forth. So there are two aspects in this question. Again, think two elements of question. One is NCSC and the other one is can the constitutional reservation which was mentioned in the Indra Sahani case and so on and so forth and whatever has been mandated, can that be included for can the uh, minority religious institutions, religious minority institutions also be included as a part of that. Like three, three parts in fact. So one, two, constitutional reservation and minority educational institution, the minority institutions. Three aspects have to be very clearly coming out in your answer. Now you tell me what can be an introduction to this question. Three elements, keep these three elements only in mind. And try to figure out an introduction in teen mein se ek hi element ke baare mein aap introduction mein likhoge ya teeno ke baare mein likhoge ya do ke baare mein likhoge. I am trying to tell you how to think about writing an answer. Right. So minority institutions, reservations, constitutional reservation and CSC. What will you, what can be the introduction to this? Please put up your hands and answer. <coughs> Anyone? Yes. Okay. Okay. So he says that I will talk about Article 338. I will talk about NCSC and then what is the power, uh, what are the powers or what are the roles and functions of the NCSC broadly in my introduction. Okay. What else? Yes. So Yelko, Sida Igdam, it is a case of one. Your point is right. But see, try to think that introduction has to link organically with your body of the answer. Before that, let's leave all of this apart. 
द क्वेश्चन इज NCSC की पावर्स क्या है माइनॉरिटी एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशंस की पावर्स क्या है राइट वॉट यू एसेंशली सेट सो हाउ इज दैट डज थ्री थर्टी एट अलाउ आर्टिकल थर्टी और लेट से आर्टिकल ट्वेंटी नाइन टू बी ट्रम्प्ड ओवर इन ऑर्डर टू एंश्योर आर्टिकल 15 के अंदर जो भी हमने चेंजेस किए हैं उसकी इंप्लीमेंटेशन के लिए दैट इज वॉट द क्वेश्चन नाउ यू नो वॉट इज टू बी रिटर्न इन अ सेंस यू विल राइट दैट येस और नो दिस इज वॉट हैज टू गो इन टू योर बॉडी ऑफ द आंसर राइट क्लियर नाउ यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट हाउ डू आई रिलेट this yes or no first of all you tell me is the answer yes or no first there is there cannot be an ambivalent answer to this right is there a yes or a no no right so it cannot be done it cannot be done why can it not be done answer that who says it cannot be done please put up your hands and then answer why it cannot be yes how this is to be done by the parliament how anyone else who has an answer to this why no yes religious okay anyone else yes yes okay yes okay 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 agar ye hai तो इस कॉलेज के अंदर रिजर्वेशन क्यों है इसको तो पैसा मिलता है गवर्नमेंट से एडेड है सो नाउ व्हाई नो इज बिकॉज द सुप्रीम कोर्ट एज वेल एज द अमेंडमेंट्स व्हिच आर बीन मेड इन द इंडियन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन आर सच व्हिच क्लियरली स्पेसिफाई दैट इट वुड नॉट बी एप्लीकेबल टू द इंस्टीट्यूशन under article 30 of the indian constitution the article 15 clause 5 of the indian constitution clearly keeps out jo amendment kiya gaya tha kaun sa amendment kiya gaya tha 2005 mein yes 93rd constitutional amendment 2005 purposefully kept the minority educational institutions out of it and try to understand the logic behind it the indra sahani case said that kisi bhi case mein overall reservation jo hai wo 50% ke upar nahi ja sakta hai right that's what indra sahani case said now in the 1991 saint stephens versus union of india case the supreme court pronounced that minority educational institutions can give 50% reservation to minorities in 2003 the supreme court of india in tma pi case again reiterated this and said that this can go well above 50% also the point is supreme court of india in both its judgment said minority educational institutions as per the indian constitution which is read under article 29 and especially article 30 they have been given the powers to administer their own affairs and therefore they can have reservations and above 50% as well now if reservation was to be provided for sc sts and obcs also 
सेवन एंड हाफ फिफ्टीन एंड हाउ मच ट्वेंटी टू ट्वेंटी सेवन है ना सॉरी ट्वेंटी सेवन ना याद तो जनरल कैटेगरी के लिए ये बचेगा ठीक है सो गोइंग बाय दिस लॉजिक इन द नाइनटी थर्ड कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल अमेंडमेंट ओनली फॉलोइंग फ्रॉम द टीएमए बाय केस the government of india ensured that this constitutional reservation would not be applicable to minority educational institutions as simple as that because if you would do that then indra sahani judgment would be violated one second is that under article 30 of the constitution these institutions have been given their own right to administer themselves and that would be a violation of the fundamental rights under the indian constitution so this cannot be done this and therefore you why it cannot be done one is the so you need to draw that in your introduction pe main wapas se aaunga why it cannot be done one article 30 of the indian constitution second 93rd constitutional amendment which introduced changes in article 15 clause 5 of the indian constitution and you should also say that the power to amend this does not lie with anyone why because supreme court has already given judgment on this right supreme court has already given judgment on this and no one has the authority to tinker with this because article 30 and the right of the minority educational institutions to manage themselves is a part of the indian concept of secularism which is a basic which is a part of the basic structure of the indian constitution which cannot be taken away by anyone and the supreme court has already given its verdict on this so national commission for scheduled types or scheduled castes or whatever no one can do anything even though it has been given this also has a constitutional mandate to safeguard the interest of the scheduled castes but that cannot come at the cost of the concept of secularism in the indian constitution upheld in the keshavanand bharati case again upheld in terms of the right of the educational minority educational institutions to govern themselves in the tma by case 2003 same stephens case 1991 and also under article 30 of the constitution this is what has to be the body of your answer now you can write a generic thing to this but a lot of people would have written also they will not get marks for this they might get overall bahut acche marks milenge but this question requires you to cite if not specific judgment of the supreme court saying that minority educational institution article 30 agar aapne nahi likha isme agar aapne article 338 nahi likha agar aapne article 15 plus 5 nahi likha marks nahi milenge See those people, those who are checking, are very clear in their mind about such things. You don't mention; you will get one or two marks. आपको वो सब कहानी लिखने का एक नंबर मिल जाएगा. But those articles of the Indian Constitution have to. You need not know the judgments. It's not possible for you to know the judgment that T M A Pai case में हुआ था या Saint Stephen's case में हुआ था and all of those things. But at least you should know the basic of this, right? And this came in the newspaper, Indian Express. There was an article which was there. Go and search up about it. There was an article in Indian Express on this when the Chief Minister of UP made a statement. It very clearly said that it is possible. He is not. In that article, it was very clearly written that this is not something which can be done by the government, or this is not something which can be done so easily. You would need a constitutional amendment, that too, which has to be approved of by the by the Supreme Court. which may or may not hold the test of the basic structure of the constitution being amended by the supreme court theek okay. hai
so this is the thing now what do you write in the introduction and the conclusion and how do you sort of you know manage your answer my idea of writing a good introduction to this question will be to actually begin from writing about article 30 of the indian constitution and writing about the rights which have been given to the religious minority institutions and how they should be governed this is a very essential part of the secularism in india and in recent times there have been voices which have been raised that should constitutional reservations to the scs and the sts and the obcs etc not be extended to these institutions as well and then you should bring in article 338 that what is the role of the ncsc but how ncsc does not have powers to do something like this not only ncsc even the parliament of india perhaps does not have answers but has the powers to do something like this because it has been vested as a power with the religious minorities or with any minority aur ye isme ek cheez aur dhyan rakhna ye sirf यहां पे तो रिलीजियस माइनॉरिटी लिखा है बट आर्टिकल 30 इज नॉट ओनली फॉर रिलीजियस माइनॉरिटी राइट तो माइनॉरिटी में भी एक्सटेंड हो रहा है तो उसके अंदर एक बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग चीज लिखी भी थी आर्टिकल में कि अगर तमिलनाडु के अंदर हिंदी स्पीकिंग पीपल सेट अप देयर ओन इंस्टीट्यूशन देन इन दैट केस दैट वुड आल्सो बी कंसीडर्ड एज अ माइनॉरिटी एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशन एमईआई जिसको आपने कहीं भी बहुत सारी जगह पे लिखा है राइट and as far as conclusion for this particular answer is concerned see there is the conclusion is that you have to kind of reiterate what you have said in the entire answer there is no isme kuch suggestion to de nahi sakte aap right you can't give any suggestion it's a very constitutional question so you simply write that as can be seen above the power which has been vested so and so and this and that it cannot be this thing and ncsc does not have the power to simple that's the only way you will write or koi tarika nahi hai matlab kuch nahi dega one liner conclusion will be written 10 words nothing more than that so you you will realize that see first question conclusion wasn't asked for but you still wrote it but it should not like force fit it second question there is no scope for a conclusion but you will still write it but it should be just a summary of what you have written a few questions later you will realize that conclusion is very important i'll come to that question now let's come to that question uh yes uh we have multi okay 16th question 16th question hello multiplicity of various commissions for the vulnerable sections of the society leads to problems of overlapping jurisdiction and duplication of functions we have multiple you know uh, bodies which are existing in our body uh, in our uh, sorry in our uh, uh, country for ensuring the upholding the rights of the vulnerable sections women children scs sts obcs right so they have overlapping jurisdiction also and they have duplication of functions and it leads to problem of overlapping jurisdiction and uh, duplication of functions it is better to merge all the commissions into an umbrella human rights commission argue your case pehli baat to ye isme ambivalent answer nahi ho sakta you have to take one stand and argue and say that this is what i believe but always remember a good person a good lawyer someone who is a good you know someone who is good at arguing would always know the other side of the argument as well and therefore in your answer it has to come out clearly that i understand that this is what my stand is and i also understand this is what the contention of the other party is but i take this stand because it has more weight so this question would need an elaborate conclusion in that sense and your conclusion is very important in this in fact your entire answer is conclusion if you look at it right so you need to that's why a lot of people come say ki sir isme introduction likhna hai isme conclusion likhna 
you need to develop that habit of being able to identify where a conclusion is required, where it is not required, what is required, and all of those things have to come into your picture in that sense. Anyway, let's move on to third question. Very simple question. You know, there is nothing to discuss in this. There is nothing to talk about in this. It says, under what circumstances can the financial emergency be proclaimed by the President of India? Ab, sabse important baat ye that if you have not read Lakshmi Khan properly, you will not be able to write the answer to this question easily. Right? What are the conditions? Kya conditions hai? Batao zara koi. Someone put up your hand and please tell me. Please put up hands and then answer. Who can give me a good answer to this? What are the conditions, circumstances? Yes. Financial threat to India. Okay. Cheek hai. Or, ye likha hai usme. See, dekho, ek aur cheez. Now, everyone will write. Sabhi ko pata hai. Financial, sab ko pata hai. It's there, but no one knows how to write this. That, that's the challenge. That's what I was telling you. The challenge of this question is not that this is not known. Sabko pata hai. Likh ke dikhao to manu. That is the challenge. UPSC identified that. Unko pata tha ki 356 denge, 352, 356 denge to likh denge. 360 mein maza aega. Let's see. For who will write what? Yes. Yes. Yes, very good. So financial stability or the credit of India or any of its territory is under threat. It in that gives powers to the president of India to invoke a financial emergency in the country under Article 360 of the Constitution. Financial stability and credit of India or any of its territory. Please remember, this is so important. See, you try to understand one thing. If you are an examiner, someone writes financial threat, someone writes financial stability or credit of India or any of its territory is under threat, whom will you give marks? Everyone will write financial threat, everyone will get half a mark. Someone who writes this will get two marks. That is what the difference is. So therefore, some of the things you, this is, this looks like an extremely easy question, believe me. This is an extremely difficult question. Because this question is not about just understanding. You need to know the exact thing. Nahi pata hai to nahi milenge marks. Financial threat लिखने के marks थोड़े ना मिलेंगे इस question में यार UPSC को भी पता है कि आप सबको पता है आप prelims clear करके आए हो you people are writing mains you know what is financial emergency but do you exactly know how to put it in words that's the question right so it says under what circumstances can so the article of the constitution says Article 360 empowers the president to proclaim a financial emergency if he is satisfied that a situation has arisen due to which the financial stability or credit of India or any part of its territory is threatened. This is what are the conditions or circumstances under which financial emergency can be invoked by the president of India. And you please make sure that number ka question is one part to yehi. Right? It's not an easy question. People, those who will say that this is an easy question, don't know that what it takes to write something like this. You people question yourself. Aap logon mein se, samadhe pada hoga. Koi hai sa yaha pada jisko nahi pata thi. Article 360. Par kitne log lik sakte hai isko. Thik hai? So, then after that, see, what you just need to talk about that when it is proclaimed, it has to be approved of by the houses of the parliament within two months and this and that and everything. What are the consequences of that? Right? Right consequences in terms of what happens to the state center relations, what happens to the canons of fiscal impropriety, the salaries could be cut down, right? So all of those things, you know, fiscal measures could be taken to ensure the uh, so and so of India, right? And uske andar aapko wohi usi Aapko Lakshmi Kant ko invoke karna hoga that till now no particular situation of the invoking of financial emergency has arisen in India. Even though India faced a crisis, economic crisis in 1991, then also financial emergency was not. 
यू नीड टू राइट दिस और कहा क्या लिखोगे फिर इसमें वरना मार्क्स नहीं मिलेंगे रिमेंबर लक्ष्मीकांत में भी ये सब लिखा है राइट right? वही लिखना पड़ेगा तभी मार्क्स मिलेंगे नहीं मिलने वाले अदरवाइज एवरी वन नोज दंसर टू दिस क्वेश्चन देर इज नथिंग यू नो दिस थिंग एंड वॉट कॉन्सिक्वेंस इज फॉलो वेन सच अ डिक्लेरेशन इज दिस थिंग सो वॉट आर द थिंग्स एग्जीक्यूटिव रिलेशन में क्या चेंज आता है लेजिस्लेटिव रिलेशन में क्या चेंज आता है मेजर इज दिव रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन दी सेंटर एंड द स्टेट चेंजेस Uh, the executive authority of the center extends to directing any state to observe such canons of financial propriety as are specified by it, and to directions as the president may deem necessary and adequate for the purpose. Any such direction may include a provision requiring reduction of salaries and allowances for all or any classes of persons serving in the state, reservation of all the money bills or the other financial bills for the consideration of the president after they are passed by the legislature of the state. The president may issue directions for the reduction of salaries and allowances of. All or all the classes of persons serving the union and the judges of the Supreme Court and the High Court. This is what is mentioned in the Article 360 of the Constitution. And plus, apart from that, what I said that even in spite of facing the economic crisis in 1991, the financial emergency was not invoked. It has not been invoked till now, and so on and so forth. Right? That's all. Okay. Question number fourth. What do you think? Why do you think? the committees are considered to be useful for parliamentary work why do you think the committees are considered to be useful they are considered matlab upsc khud nahi comment kar raha hai ki they are useful or not why do you think they are considered to be useful for parliamentary work and then it says discuss in this context the role of estimate committee again you know if you look at the major thing one is the committees of the parliament and why are they useful for parliamentary work parliament ke kaam ke liye kis tarike se committees useful hai how do they help the parliament in its functioning ensure what and for that you need to know what is parliament's work पार्लियामेंट का काम क्या है उसके अंदर किस तरीके से कमिटीज उसको हेल्प करते सी दिस इज वेरी ऑब्वियस थिंग बट यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड इफ यू डू नॉट हैव दिस इन योर माइंड यू विल समाउ लूज द डायरेक्शन ऑफ योर आंसर एंड देन दी अदर इज डिस्कस इन दिस कॉन्टेक्ट द रोल ऑफ एस्टिमेट कमेटी रोल ऑफ एस्टिमेट कमेटी डिस्कस करना है नाउ प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड दिस इफ आई वुड हैव गिवन दिस क्वेश्चन Explain the role of estimate committee, or what is the role of estimate committee? And the question which UPSC has asked is: Discuss the role of estimate committee. What do you think is the difference? Please put up your hand and answer. Discuss the role of estimate committee. What is the role of estimate committee? Do you think there is any difference between these two? Yes or no? First, yes. So then answer. Yeah, answer now. okay anyone else who might want to improve on that answer is yes one second one second ha huh. okay importance of that committee with respect to others yes now yes okay hmm. स लिमिटेशन सो बेसिकली रोल क्या है राइट एंड देन वॉट आर द लिमिटेशन नाउ लिमिटेशन कैन बी इन एनी वे यू नो इन टर्म्स ऑफ दैट इट इज मेरली रेकमेंडेटरी इट इज अ पोस्ट फैक्ट टू एक्सरसाइज इट कुड बी एनीथिंग और इट इज जस्ट डन बाय द मेंबर्स ऑफ पार्लियामेंट ओनली अनदर लिमिटेशन कुड बी मेजोरिटी ऑफ द मेंबर्स आर फ्रॉम द रूलिंग पार्टी ओनली राइट सो ऑल ऑफ दोज लिमिटेशन और लिमिटेशन विद रिस्पेक्ट टू दैट मे बी इट डज नॉट हैव द सेम काइंड ऑफ expertise which is available to let's say a psc right public accounts committee has the expertise of who cag estimates committee does not have that so those things are needed to be sort of brought out in your answer completely right so when we are talking about the second part so please again understand this paper is looking easy 
you falter one step, you lose those two extra marks. So the difference is going to be how you interpret the question. Discuss in this context the rule of estimates committee. Discuss करना है. Discuss जब आप करोगे किसी भी चीज़ को तो आप उसकी limitations भी discuss करोगे, functions भी discuss करोगे, positives भी discuss करोगे, negatives भी discuss करोगे. But all of this has to be done within 150 words. That's the problem. <laughs> right? So you can't go beyond a point. Anyway, let's first talk about the first part very quickly. <coughs> all of you know about this very quickly. Let's just understand what is the work of parliament. legislation and what else accountability of the executive to the legislature to the people of the country and ensuring that each and every single penny which is spent out of the public exchequer or the consolidated fund of india it is spent only after the approval by the parliament or the representative of the people that is what the estimates committee uh, that is what the function of parliament is Now, how do the committees of parliament help in this parliamentary work? So, your answer could either begin by the committees of the parliaments help the parliament in various domains, including legislation, comma, ensuring accountability of executive to the parliament, comma, this, this, this. this could be one introduction how you explain it further right introduction aur uske baad fir aapne usko niche link kar diya that is one way the second could be that you straight away start talking about that parliamentary committees were formed with the idea of so and so and how they help my session will be start with the first one and usi ke andar jab aap legislation mein likhoge to then you write that not all the laws and the policies can be discussed on the floor of the parliament because parliament is too wieldy a group to discuss anything constructively so discussion has to happen in a smaller group one second is parliament is composed of laymen they do not have understanding of specific issues when you form the estimates committee or you form the psc or you form any of these department related standing committees or any of these parliamentary committees what you are doing essentially is you are getting in expertise right standing committees of the parliament you could have expertise for different sections say for example shashi tharoor is an expert in foreign affairs we'll get him there someone is an expert in uh, health we'll get them there right someone has an expert in legal issues we'll get them into the legal drafting committee so brings in expertise third and very important point is consensus evolution cannot happen in again that larger group the proceedings of all of these committees are supposed to be kept secret and what happens as a result is whatever a politician might come and say out in the public he would always have a he might have a different view in the committee meetings because there it is above party lines these committees are committees of parliament not of committee of bjp or congress or any party so therefore people rise above party lines in these committee meetings therefore consensus evolution happens in a better manner debate happens in a better manner all the work which has to be done by the parliament on the floor given the shortage of time given the number of issues which have to be discussed all of this can be done by the committee and then you can also give examples of something like a psc has the advantage of an expert opinion in form of the cag as well who acts as a friend philosopher so this is what has to be written in your answer and then you talk about amongst these committees one of the and see also understand one thing Always try to organically relate, even though ये दोनों जो parts हैं बहुत अलग अलग पूछे गए हैं. Both the parts have been separately asked in the question. When you are writing the second part of the answer, guys, please ensure that you try to relate it to the first part. Don't make it so this thing कि अच्छा ये लिख दिया आप इसको लिख देते हैं. 
try to relate say that amongst the above committees estimate committee is a very important committee composed of 30 members of the lok sabha some of its functions are so and so but in spite of these function and the importance of these functions lies in this but some of the limitations are also there and in this answer when you are giving a conclusion just give one one liner about how these committees their functioning can be strengthened even further okay now the only challenge again is 150 words the challenge still remains to be the same so therefore you will have to be intelligent about how do you write it and that's why i'm saying that this class is just 25% of if you really want to extract out of this class please go back and try to write answer nahi hoga 150 word mein 170 180 200 word se kam mein nahi hoga try to write rewrite rewrite 3 4 5 fifth time maybe you will be able to get it that will set you a gold standard. Now we will citizen charter. Mein baat karenge, se uttam hota hai, gold standard in citizen charter. Your answer which will come out after 4 to 5 iterations will be your gold standard of answers. And you should, you will always remember that that my answer should be this level. Ka hona that is when I will get the maximum possible marks in UPSC. That is the level you have to achieve. And let that answer quality guide you. No one else answer is going to topper ka answer se guide nahi hoga ki ye acha answer hota hai. Paanch chhe baar jab khud us answer ko reiterate karke chhe chhati baar likhoge. Six time your answer would be that gold standard which you need to keep as that thing in mind that this is what I need to. This is the standard which I have to achieve in all my answers. Every time in the first go. That is what your attempt should be. Get it? Okay. Question number fifth. This is something which I was expecting. I told it several times during discussions in mains test series as well as main 365 classes that this question is very important. Hai, CAG ke role ke the question was the CAG has a very vital role to play. Explain how this is reflected in the method and the terms of his appointment as well as the range of the powers he can exercise. Right? The uh, most important uh, you know person who framed the Indian constitution Dr. V. R. Ambedkar himself said that this is the most important officer under the Indian constitution the CAG. Why? Because he is the ultimate guardian of the public purse in the country ensuring that the parliament is spending on the things or, or the executive is spending money in the right possible manner on the things which it has been uh, it has been given the powers to spend money on right so you begin your answer by that only Konsa constitution ka article hai? 148 the cons the uh, wherever you get an opportunity write the article of the constitution under article 148 of the Indian constitution the CAG has been given the powers to ensure the financial propriety in the country and so on and so forth, right? Or he is said to be the ultimate guardian of the public purse in the country, said to be the most important officer under the Indian constitution by the by Dr. D. R. Ambedkar. Once you have mentioned that, then you say that this importance is reflected in his appointment, removal, other terms and conditions of his service as well as the powers which have been vested in him as can be seen below that's all right so all of you know that you know he or she his terms and salaries etc cannot be changed once after appointment he is not eligible for any appointment under government of india once appointed as a CAG right the removal has to happen as that of judge of supreme court all the salaries of his office and his salary allowances privilege uh, pensions etc are charged on the consolidated fund of india all of these cannot be changed except by the parliament of india executive does not have any 
So all these independence has been given to ensure that this institution remains fair, impartial, bipartisan. Once that is written, then you also talk about that the powers have been also vested in him in various ways in terms of functions as well. Pehle to aap likhiye normal audit jo hota hai, CAG ka. That he has to ensure that money should be spent only on the purpose for which it has been assigned. Money should be spent only by the authority to which has been assigned. And only that much amount of money should be spent which has been assigned. Apart from that, he also comes out with these reports etc. which are tabled in the front of the parliament through the president of India. He acts as a friend philosopher and a guide to the PAC which is a very important body or a committee of the parliament to ensure fiscal propriety. Then you should say that the the CAG has also interpreted in the recent times the powers vested in it, it, in it under the Indian constitution to go beyond the normal, just the, uh, the, the conventional audit. But he is now looking into impropriety as well. He is also looking into effectiveness economy and efficiency of the expenditure which has been made by the executive. Right? So you write all those things and then later on in your conclusion you should say that CAG is one of the most important officers as has also been seen in its role in unearthing some of the biggest scams in the country including the 2G, the CWG, the coal, this, that, everything. And the independence of this institution should continue to be maintained and so on so forth. So, itna hi isko answer ko likhna. Again, if you will realize the question is very basic, right out of Lakshmi Kant. The only thing is that you need to ensure that you write it in a proper structured manner with some relevance from here and there. Okay. Question number sixth. Is can there may I examples with that? That what are the examples of where policy contradictions amongst various competing sectors and stakeholders have resulted in inadequate protection and prevention of degradation to the environment? See what has happened in the recent times is that both the UP and the NDA government have been accused of compromising the tenets of prevent or securing our environment vis-a-vis -vis the developmental concerns, whether it is development of the roads or whether it is development of any industrial corridors and this and that and so many other things. So this question has come in light of that. It says that there are policy contradictions among various sectors various competing sectors and stakeholders. So you need to understand that who are these stakeholders and competing sectors, right? What are these policy, you know, contradiction sectors? So for example, power ministry versus environment ministry. There is a contradiction, policy contradiction, which is there. Ministry of Tribal Affairs versus Environment Ministry again. Okay. And in this Ministry of Mining, Minerals, etc. and so on and so forth, they have also come into conflict. Policy contradictions are there amongst various sectors. Okay. You can also give example of environment versus infrastructure port has to be created roads have to be created there is a conflict between the infrastructure ministry of road transport versus ministry of environment and forest ministry of shipping versus ministry of environment and forest right yes urban development 
and again Ministry of something which recently came up in context of Delhi, 7,000 trees have to be fell and so on and so forth, right? So what should be given more importance? Where, whose policy should be given more importance? So this you can mention. You can also mention about, <coughs> came up with list of things. Yes. Uh, industrial licensing versus in Ministry of, you know, DIPP ho gaya versus again Ministry of Environment and Forest, right? So all of these things have to be kind of mentioned in this. Now the question and then stakeholders as well. Industrial groups versus tribals. Industrial groups versus uh, you know minorities. Some uh, sorry, uh, not minority. Some wildlife. Right? Stakeholders, different stakeholders. It could be village councils, right, versus some particular ministry of infrastructure or mining or whatever. Right. So all of these things have to be also mentioned. Now, it says policy contradictions among various competing sectors and stakeholders have resulted in inadequate protection and prevention of degradation to environment combined with relevant illustrations. See, there can be, you can also take an otherwise stance on this particular question, but the question itself is so, and then it will be very difficult to write in 150 words both the sides. Bon so my suggestion would be that in your conclusion, you show some positive side that you know it's not all gloomy that these contradictions are not only leading to environmental degradation uh, there have been funds for example which have been created right the mineral ke liye ek dmf set up kiya gaya district mineral foundation has been set up all that money which comes out of the royalty which has been accruing would be then going will be flowed back into that district only in terms of various developmental efforts right so you need to mention those kind of things in your this thing. You could you could always take a contrary stance also. The problem is that if you contrary stance, loge, to lihna bada mushkil ho jayega. Right? So by design, the question is like that. So by design, you have to write some of the contradictions. You can just write down some of the contradictions. I mean, if you want to write down, one is you can talk about power ministry versus environment ministry that uh, the CEA, the Central Electrical Authority, uh, allowed more than 300 and more than 300 thermal power plants to not comply by strict environmental regulations, right? So now the concern comes up that we are lacking. So power ministry ka mandate kya hai? CEA ka mandate kya hai? Their mandate is to ensure maximum power production in the country. Their mandate is to ensure that each and everyone gets power. So that's their policy mandate. What is the policy mandate of the Ministry of Environment and Forest or the NGT? That is to protect the environment. So this policy is coming in conflict with each other because of lack of clarification, lack of clarity on both the policies not being made in sync with each other. One. Second, you can write down is with respect to man-animal conflict, let's say, right? So should the traffic be allowed through the Bandipur, you know, uh, Tiger Forest Reserve, so uh, Bandipur Tiger Reserve. So that also is again a conflict which is coming up. You could talk about the conflict which came up in case of the Starlight Industry protest recently, right? So the Starlight Environmental Impact Assessment, Environmental Impact Assessment Guidelines came in 2006, which said that under an industrial zone, you know, these things would not apply. They, but there should be a clearance which should be given. Green clearance has to be given. But there was no clarity which was there on the green clearing. There, there was no clarity which has which was given on the <laughs> so, yeah, so the clarity which has to be given on the green clearance, whether green clearance is required for these plants to be set up within the industrial zones or not. And what happens to those plants which do not have the green clearance? Do they also not comply with environmental regulations in these industrial parks? Right? What happened in Tutikoran? So you need to mention those two, three relevant things from the recent times. 
and you need to mention some of these conflicts. You also need to mention how the conflict is happening between the tribals and let's say between some uh, you know, uh, mega hydro power project which is coming up. So all of these are contradictions, policy contradiction. Policy contradiction is the policy of the Ministry of uh, you know, uh, this thing, water transport or shipping is to develop the ports. Now the policy of environment ministry is different. So where do you draw a line and where do you get both of them together on the common pace so that the environmental degradation doesn't happen. And in this when you are giving the conclusion, you talk about not just you know how you know you, these steps have been taken, you also talk about that how more innovation is needed in this area. How we need to have an overarching policy for all these sectors which have which are coming in conflict with each other again and again. Also, you need to mention that, say, for example, environmental impact assessment guidelines say something else. Whereas, if you want to, you're saying ease of doing business is difficult. Ease of doing business is also difficult because environmental clearances are very difficult to get in this country. So the mandate of Ministry of Corporate Affairs as a policy is to promote industrial development in the country and environment ministry ka to bilkul hi alag hai. So you need to bring them in sync with each other. That's the contradiction which you need to get out in this question. Nothing else. It's kuch. Don't try to attempt much. Just relevant examples, three, four relevant examples, stakeholder wise, sector wise, what are the contradictions which are coming up between them and then what can be done or what has been done by the government in the recent times in order to ensure. Yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 that's what I said. You know, Panda Tiger Reserve, Bandipur Tiger Reserve, you could talk about, as I said, the CEA giving clearance to these 300 thermal power projects. Uh, you could also talk about industrial development, effluent discharge yoga. So, fir again, river, uh, you know, iske, uh, jo aapne iske ganga uske liye ministry set up kari hai, uske andar is tarikhe se there is conflict. So, whatever examples, you know, just write any four or five relevant examples in this. Yes. For one is comment, what does comment means? That you have to kind of give a view on this particular aspect. Now, as I said, that ideally, if this would have been a 250 word question, you would have been able to write both the sides, right? Not only the contradiction, but how there is a sink also, which is there between the policies and all of those things and how the government. But the fact is that since you have just 150 words, the limitation is that you cannot. Yes more fo focus on contradictions leading to environmental degradation. How the rules have been laxed for leading to environmental degradation in certain places. And then finally you could give a counter view also just to balance your answer. Okay. Any doubts? Okay. Ji. Huh. Yeah, yeah, so that was because your EIA rules were not clear. That clearance chahiye ki nahi chahiye. See, basically the question was that in the industrial parks, the environmental regulations do not apply. But before that, do you have the clearance to set it up in the industrial park or not was the question. That clearance was not available to Sterling, right? So, but the EIA was not very clear. It was a very ambiguous thing which had been mentioned in the EIA. It was not mentioned that it, it came down to that question that whether it is there or not. And it was a matter of interpretation for everyone. And wherever, see, you will realize wherever there is a matter of interpretation, the government will go ahead with the side which they want to take. Because then obviously, if mentioned, they not the court would have pulled them up. Right or the entity would have pulled them up. So that is the question. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. So we kind of run out of time. We'll quickly try to wrap this up. E-governance is not only about utilization of power of new technology, but also much about critical importance of use value of information. See, now 
like to be honest like i was trying to search up on the internet what is this use value of information upsc has manufactured a term of its own when it comes to use value of information now my interpretation of this and i am being very honest this is my interpretation of this question and i am like i try to understand that what this could be it says e governance is not only about utilization of the power of new technology that is that you should not only install new computers or you should not only have broadband or you should not only have websites or biometrics or linking of each and everything to each other but you should also know about the critical importance of use value of information the information which is being generated for the government or for the citizens it should be useful it should not just be a trash now what do i mean by that <clears throat> say for example ministry of corporate affairs tomorrow says that pehle inke paas koi website nahi thi kuch nahi tha koi information nahi thi inhone bola ji humne apni ek website khol li hai now we have become e governance savvy we have set up our website information is available is that information relevant is that and that it should not just be information so information in itself is not the point first is there information all the information available also is that platform interactive can i make use of that information which you have given say for example aapne wahan pe likh diya that these are the guidelines for setting up a particular company but if i want more clarity on it is there any way for me to use that existing information etc one is that is one interpretation of this so one interpretation could be of this use value part that you talk about how the information which is available on portals government websites all those technology which is being deployed it should be at the end useful for the uh, citizens right it should not just be merely information but information which can be put to use what i mean to say is that let's say if you have put some you know that aapne uh, wahan pe dal diya that this is the electoral roll ka data aapne wahan pe 50 crore logo ka electoral roll ka data dal diya i if i cannot search my name in that आपने उसको एक ऐसे फॉर्म में डाला है नॉट लोकेट माय नेम इन इट व्हाट इज़ द पॉइंट ऑफ दैट टेक्नोलॉजी दिस इज वन इंटरप्रिटेशन इट शुड बी इंटरक्टिव इट शुड बी अ टू वे कम्युनिकेशन दैट इज सेकंड इंटरप्रिटेशन अनदर इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑफ दिस इज दैट वॉट एवर डेटा इज बींग जनरेटेड लेट से विद्प ऑफ आधार बायोमेट्रिक दिस दैट हाउ डज गवर्नमेंट यूटिलाइज इट सो e governance should not stop at merely getting data from people or getting feedback from people or having this information let's say smart city smart city will never become a smart city till the time you analyze that data till the time you have some big data application let's say that this particular area i know x particular area rajendra nagar has this kind of crime Tolbagh has this kind of crime. Patel Nagar has this kind of crime. Subhash Nagar has this kind of crime. Am I utilizing and analyzing that data? Am I using the value stored in that data to make governance better? Am I saying that okay, in this area we will focus only on this particular aspect of governance. In this area we will focus on this aspect of governance. GIS ka example lekar aao yahan par. the data which is being generated through gis if you are not utilizing that for ensuring that this kind of soil requires this fertilizer application this particular climatic condition means tsunami would occur or flood would occur or drought would occur if you are not using that use value of information then what is the point of this entire e governance and e technology so these are the two three interpretation which i could get out of this question right to be honest to me this still remains to be a very ambiguous question if any one of you has been able to understand it i invite any one of you to sort of throw in your ideas yes sorry 
Okay, maybe GST as GST network aspect can also be brought in. Fine. Any anyone who has a different interpretation of this question altogether? Yes. Privacy. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, this question is more about e-governance aspect and such. I doubt. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Yes. Okay. Anyone else who has any interpretation of this question? See. Yes. So yeah, Shamul. Hmm. See, मेरे को तो वही लगा, big data analysis, but I am trying. See, you can't just take one dimension in UPSC questions. It's very dangerous. Dangerous इसलिए क्योंकि आपने big data पकड़ के लिख दिया उसमें, और examiner के सामने जो model answer उसमें दस चीजें लिखी हुई हैं, तो फिर आपको वो number नहीं मिलेंगे. So you need to keep your possibilities open. हाँ जी. Sorry? Digital inclusion, yes. So that obviously is you know an important part of it that everyone has to be this thing it has to be useful for everyone and all those things yes right so that's why i said interactive it has to be available to everyone it should be accessible to everyone everyone should have access to this thing and it's not just about technology right for example iske andar ek cheez aur bhi likh sakte ho aap iska ek jo sabse mere ko possible introduction iska jo ek abhi ekdam source se usse dimag mein aa raha hai that is आपने कंप्यूटर इंस्टॉल कर दिए क्योस बना दिए पर उन क्योस को यूज करने का तरीका नहीं आता लोगों को और हाउ टू एक्सेस दी इंफॉर्मेशन ऑन दैट क्योस्क नहीं आता है या फिर आपने कंप्यूटर तो इंस्टॉल कर दिए यू हैव इंस्टॉल कंप्यूटर्स यू हैव इंस्टॉल्ड ऑल द टेक्नोलॉजी बट योर गवर्नमेंट प्रोसेस आर स्टिल आर के राइट कि मेरे को अभी भी प्रिंट निकालना पड़ेगा फिर उस प्रिंट का निकाल के फिर जाना पड़ेगा फिर वहां पे साइन कराना पड़ेगा फिर एक जगह जाना पड़ेगा वो स्कैन कॉपी लेंगे उसका राइट right? काम डिजिटली हो रहा है बट एवरीथिंग एल्स कंटिन्यूज टू बी द सेम सिंगल विंडो क्लियरेंस इज नॉट देयर इन प्लेस यस यस आई थिंक क्रिटिकल इंपॉर्टेंस इन इंपॉर्टेंस इज Like I I don't think don't I I doubt if you should read much into that. It means critical like importance. वो वो बढ़ाने के लिए critical importance है. Otherwise don't read much into that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, very important point. So, what is I I know what you're trying to say. मतलब yeah, yeah, yeah. Any website, government. So that's the kind of thing which I was mentioning earlier also. And you're right. आप कोई भी government website खोलिए. What he's saying is that user experience design. I mean, you know, to put it in very simple terms, जब आप website खोलते हो government की, मैं आज तक मेरे को कोई एक government की website ऐसी नहीं मिली, जिसको मैं खोल के मेरे को समझ में आता है कि उस website में कहाँ जाना है. Right? You don't know where to go. There is everything on that website. Every possible thing, chief minister ki photo, prime minister ki photo, about us, contact us, directory, rules, regulations, notification. यहाँ से एक flyer आ रहा है, वो लिख रहा है, ये tender float हुआ है, वहाँ से ही आ रहा है, apply for this. You don't know where to go. You go to UPSC website for example. Do you know what is where? There is no website guide map. Anyone who would know basic website designing would know that there has to be a structure to it. These NIC made websites are completely structureless. You don't know where what is lying. So you just get lost. You go. I'm not kidding. You go to MCA website, Ministry of Corporate Affairs. You want to register a company. You will not. I challenge. It will take you two days to figure out what is where. I tried doing that on my own. I could not. I had to call the CA. Ki please, you know, tell what is to be done in this. It's impossible to. You know, do anything on that. So probably you could mention that aspect as well. But again, I mean, you know, I somehow feel that this question was difficult for me to understand, especially because of this huge value of information. I have searched for it, but I have not found anything. I have not found anything. Yes. 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 वेरी क्विकली मूविंग ऑन टू इलेवन क्वेश्चन गाइज सुप्रीम कोर्ट जजमेंट जुलाई 2018 थाउजेंड एटीन कैन सेटल द पॉलिटिकल अब देखो बहुत अच्छी बात है इन्होंने खुद ही जुलाई टू थाउजेंड एटीन लिख दिया बिकॉज 
uh, <laughs> anyway, so it says that whether the Supreme Court judgment July 2018 can settle the political tussle between the Lieutenant Governor and the elected government of Delhi examine. Let's very quickly understand and this can the thoda some issue discuss kar leta and then we'll move on to the next question. See basically what did the Supreme Court say in, in this particular judgment where it kind of reversed the judgment of the High Court. Delhi High Court said that under Article 239 double A of the Indian Constitution, the aid and the advice which has been mentioned in the provision 4, the provision to the uh, sub clause 4 of this particular constitution article mentions aid and advice is not mandatory and he can act on his discretion. The LG can act on his discretion. And the overall administration of the Delhi lies with the LG, the left hand governor. The Supreme Court of India in a four bench judgment gave a unanimous verdict in 2018 July that except three subjects, public order, land and police, the aid and the advice mentioned in the provision 4, uh, in the provision to the sub clause 4 of article 239 AA means that the Lieutenant Governor is supposed to act on the aid and the advice compulsorily of the Council of Ministers headed by the Chief Minister of Delhi. Except in certain cases where he feels that the Union Territory and the, the Union Territory of Delhi and its security or you know its entire overall stability is coming into concern. And I'll just read out what the article, this proviso says exactly and then I'll tell you what I mean to say. It says, there shall be a council of ministers consisting of not more than 10% of the total number of so and so in the assembly with chief minister at the head to aid and advise the LG in exercise to his functions in relation to matters to which the legislative assembly has the power to make laws except in so far as he is by or any by or under any law required to act in his discretion. So the Supreme Court said that this discretion is limited and not to be used in an arbitrary manner. The Lieutenant Governor should understand that there is an elected government in power and should respect the mandate. Right? At the same time, when it says that uh, with respect to which legislative assembly has powers to make laws, the Supreme Court cited 239AA and the constitutional amendment, 69th constitutional amendment to say that the legislative assembly of Delhi has been given powers to make all the subjects in list 2 of 7th schedule of the Indian constitution except these three subjects and the executive power is concurrent with the legislative power of the Delhi state legislative assembly. Right? So executive power is drawn from that particular provision only and therefore the executive power of the Council of Ministers also extends to all the subjects except these three subjects. Samaj mein aarai? Unhone usse interpretation nikala. They said ki bhai, Delhi Legislative Assembly ko sare subjects ke upar power di gai hai legislate karne ki except these three subjects. And ye, inhone uske baad unhone ye provision pada. And they said that therefore, exec executive power always exists, coexists with legislative power. And therefore, the Delhi Chief Minister and his council have all the powers, all the executive powers on these three, on all these subjects except these three matters. And also he said that in case, so another thing which is there is provided, the constitution may mention it, provided that in case of difference of opinion between the LG and his ministers on any matter, on any matter, now on any matter, just Remember this any matter, 
the lieutenant governor shall refer it to the president for decision decision and act according to the decision given thereon by the president and pending such decision it shall be competent for the lg in any case where the matter in his opinion is so urgent that it is necessary for him to take immediate action to take such action or to give such direction in the matters as he deems necessary so two things lg first in case of any difference on any matter now the supreme court said this any matter does not mean every matter जहां पे आपका डिफरेंस आया वहां पे आप उसको प्रेसिडेंट के पास ले जाओ डज नॉट मीन एवरी मैटर इट मीन स्पेसिफिक मैटर्स एंड यू टेक इट टू द प्रेसिडेंट एंड द प्रेसिडेंट शुड गिव द एडवाइस शुड गिव द फाइनल डिसीजन इन केस इफ इट इज अ वेरी इमरजेंसी काइंड ऑफ अ सिचुएशन वेयर द प्रेसिडेंट ओपिनियन कैन नॉट बी सॉल्ट एक्सेट्रा एंड सो एंड सो फोर्थ जी एल जी शुड एक्ट इन दिस डिस्क्रिप्शन बट दिस डिस्क्रिप्शन इज लिमिटेड and only to special and exceptional circumstances to which a constitutional position and a constitutional machinery such as a lieutenant governor should be very mindful that he should not utilize this power except in exceptional circumstances so and the other thing which it also said was that lieutenant governor is not comparable to the governor he is only an administrator the supreme court also said that delhi is a sui a case a sui generi case it is a different case it is something which has come out very differently from all the other cases it is a special case delhi is not a state and therefore lieutenant governor has limited powers and not the same kind of powers as which a governor in a state enjoys right so this is what was the entire verdict now the question is that whether the supreme court judgment can settle this thing since this was a 250 words question first you had to write the origin of the tussle between the delhi government and the lg starting from what was said by the delhi high court in the november 2017 verdict jiske upar already upsc ne question puch liya tha so you had to write on that once you had written on that particular aspect that what was the tussle uh, this thing what the supreme court said in this particular thing and then finally you had to write that whether the supreme court judgment can settle the political tussle the answer to this is no because supreme court judgment has still left yes i'll come to it so supreme court judgment has still left some of the areas unexplained one area being the matter of services whether the appointments transfers removal etc comes under the chief minister or lieutenant governor bureaucracy in delhi is saying that we come under lg and not under chief minister it has not been made clear in supreme court judgment perhaps another judgment of supreme court would have to come on the matter of services that who has jurisdiction over services in delhi whether it is the lg or whether it is the chief minister and his council of ministers second aspect is that even the discretion is being interpreted by different stakeholders in different manner sheila dikshit came out and said that nothing has changed He said nothing has changed. ये तो पहले भी था, which is very, if you look at it, stupid. Because High Court gave something else. Supreme Court has so obviously things have changed. But in any case, the interpreting. So if you would, in fact, go back, both BJP and Aam Aadmi Party were claiming victory. BJP was saying, अरे वाह, ये तो same ही था. हमने बोला ही था, ऐसा ही होना था. काम नहीं कर रहा है Chief Minister. चीफ मिनिस्टर सेट की देखा हमने बोला था मोदी हमें काम नहीं करने दे रहा बोथ क्लेम्ड विक्ट्री सो देर इज स्टिल एम्बिग्विटी स्पेशली बिकॉज देर इज नो क्लैरिटी वन ऑन सर्विसेज सेकेंड ऑन दीज डिस्क्रिप्शनरी पावर्स वॉट आर दीज एक्ट सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने क्लियरली मैंशन नहीं किया सो यू नो वॉट सुप्रीम कोर्ट सेट जस्टिस चंद्रचूड इन इज दिस थिंग ही सेट इट्स वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू मैंशन दैट वॉट आर द मैटर्स अंडर विच you know discretion can be applied and not but broadly this is what it is 
but this broad thing has still left some scope for ambiguity this is what you need to bring in your answer and the other thing is you should mention that most importantly in a you know state or a semi state or a quasi state like delhi the biggest problem is that you have three different bodies governing this area and there is no clear demarcation in terms of powers in the number of areas example being the recent this thing spread about this felling of trees for construction of that corridor etc where chief minister said ki bjp kar rahi hai bjp is saying chief minister karwa raha hai so no one has any clarity that whose final call is it to get those trees cut or not right and so you in your final analysis would have to mention that the supreme court judgment is far reaching it has restored federation in many ways it has restored the balance by the uh, the tussle for power which was there between the chief minister and his council of ministers and the lieutenant governor but still some questions are unanswered and it would be in the best interest of both the lg and the chief minister and his council of ministers to come together and try to work towards a common agenda for the development of the people of delhi rather than trying to fight a political war right and this you should also mention supreme court very clearly mentioned that a constitutional machinery like ng should maintain the sanctity of that position right is a constitutional machinery and on either usne dusri side pe bhi bola that either side either party should understand the importance of constitution right so that is what has to be this thing you can always you know give an answer that it has solved the problem and everything but the answer is that ambiguity still remains over delhi and the tussle still continues theek hai okay next one twelfth question very quickly how far do you agree with the view that tribunals curtail the jurisdiction of ordinary courts in view of the above discuss the constitutional validity and competency of tribunals in india <coughs> constitutionality or competency dono ke upar sawal uthaye gaye hain both competency and constitutional validity of the tribunals are uh, tribunals and how far do you agree with the view that they curtail the jurisdiction of the ordinary courts first of all this question structuring in itself is so complex if you try going by answering this question as per the structure of the question you will not be able to question, answer it properly बिकॉज आप पहले वो लिखोगे फिर उसके बाद वो लिखोगे और फिर वो वापस सब कॉन्वल्यूट हो जाएगा सो इंट्रोडक्शन टू दिस शुड बिगिन बाय टॉकिंग अबाउट द रैशनल ऑफ 323 ए एंड 323 बी व्हाट वाज द रैशनल विद विच द ट्राइब्यूनल्स वर सेटअप एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव ट्राइब्यूनल्स वर सेटअप इन इंडिया यू राइट अबाउट दैट यू नो एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव ट्राइब्यूनल्स एंड एज वेल एज स्पेसिफिक ट्राइब्यूनल्स फॉर स्पेसिफिक इश्यूज अंडर थ्री बी very shortly but briefly lick down so once you have written that then you should say that at times several questions are raised over the tribunals in matter of one that are they taking away the original jurisdiction curtailing the jurisdiction of the ordinary courts one second with respect to their constitutionality and third with respect to their competency competency or wo jo pehla wala point hai they kind of match now first let's talk about the constitutionality sabse pehle theek hai the supreme court of india write down the case name in sp sampath kumar versus union of india sp sampath kumar versus union of india declared the constitution the tribunals to be constitutional and in l chandra kumar 1997 case again l chandra kumar versus again union of india maintained this position that tribunals are constitutional so constitutional validity pe to unke koi sawal hi nahi hai theek hai in sp sampath kumar and l chandra kumar 
right? Two cases. Now, in S. P. Sampath Kumar, the Supreme Court of India said that they are equivalent to high courts. They are equivalent to high courts. But in L. Chandra Kumar, the Supreme Court of India reversed this. They said that they are not equivalent to high courts. They are quasi judicial. They are quasi high courts. They do not have the powers of high court, but they are quasi. They are exercising the powers of high court in some ways, but they are not equivalent to high courts. Okay. So this is one aspect which has to come into your answers. Other thing is constitutionality. Ki baat karte hai. They are unconstitutional to the extent if they exclude the jurisdiction of the courts. So the original act of 1985 and the original amendment to the constitution said that the high courts would be kept out of the ambit of any jurisdiction which has been given by the tribunals and the, the appeal to the decision of the tribunals would lie directly to the Supreme Court of India. The Supreme Court has said that they are this particular aspect in Al, Chand Al Chandrumar case, they held it to be unconstitutional. They said that nothing can take away the powers of the high courts under article 226 or the Supreme Court under article 32 and therefore their judgment has to be you know it has to be up, uh, can be appealed in the high court. So they are on unconstitutional only to the extent that they exceed or they try to overpower the jurisdiction of the high court or supreme court. One is that. Second, they remain to be the first court. This was also said by supreme court. They remain to be the first court of or the first instance or first court of instance in case of areas which they are governing. First court of instance in case of areas which they are governing. Administ service conditions, electricity, uh, tax, wherever area where the uh, jurisdiction of the tribunal has been extended, they remain to be the first court of instance. Second. Third aspect, they are not substitutes of high court. This is also a constitutional part. Because question is, discuss the constitutional validity. The constitutional tab tag hai, jab tag wo high court ki validity ko question nahi karte hai. Constitutional tab tag hai, jab tag high court ki andor unki appeal lai karti hai. Right? And lastly, that there cannot be a direct appeal to the Supreme Court of India, Article 136 ke under. Special leave petition laga ke seedha aap Supreme Court nahi ja sakte. Aapko pehle High Court jana hoga, fir special leave petition laga kar aap Supreme Court ja sakte ho. So this is about the constitutional validity. Now in this only it comes, do you agree with the view that tribunals curtail the jurisdiction of ordinary courts? Yes. Yes, division bench of the high court. Yes, it will. Huh. Yes, yes, yes. Huh, you're right. What, what do you? <coughs> yes. This is uh, what was held in the L. Chandra Kumar case as well. Okay, then maybe I'll have to go and you sure about this? As your project is on this. Okay, then maybe I'll have to uh, go back and check on this. But uh, uh, okay, so he's saying that if a particular statute provides that they can directly approach the Supreme Court, then the statute overpowers. The judgment of the Supreme Court in the Al Chandra Kumar case is what you are saying. Or that's what Al Chandra Kumar case said. Okay.
fine so he, okay i got it i got it okay so so but as much as i remember reading the el chandrakumar judgment they said that the judge, uh, the appeal has to lie within the two bench a uh, two judge bench of the division bench of the high court but you are saying that if the statute provides then they can okay so he is saying that if the statute provides they can bypass the high court and the supreme court anyway so uh, coming back to the aspect of how do you agree with the view that the tribunals curtail the jurisdiction of the ordinary court see one is that the tribunals were created with a specific agenda in mind that was to provide speedy justice that was to ensure that the principle of natural justice would apply and you would not have to go through uh, you know all the evidence law and uh, the various uh, cpc etc and so on and so forth right and the most important aspect was that the ordinary courts were already overloaded with several uh, you know issues already and they were already overloaded with cases so, and the fourth aspect is that the ordinary courts do not have the expertise to deal with technical matters such as taxation such as environment such as consumer related issues etc all of these are better handled by tribunals only and therefore there is no question of tribunals curtailing the jurisdiction of the ordinary courts both of them coexist so as to ensure that rule of law and the criminal justice system and everything in the country functions properly right so that is the stance which you have to take and competency ki jahan tak baat hai you will have to write that when it comes to tribunals they are to be headed by you know whoever the chairman of the tribunal is someone who would be from background of judiciary or would be having a sound understanding of law right and he has to be supported by the officers those who have some kind of an executive experience so competency is also not in question but at the same time tribunals have been facing a crisis of legitimacy especially because of how more and more tribunals are being created which is also called as tribunalization of justice in india and also because more and more retired members of the executive are being appointed to tribunals thereby leading to compromising the principle of separation of powers between the executive and judiciary in this country so that has to be curtailed so in your final analysis you will be also talking about the competency part right so three aspects one competency second constitutionality and the third one with respect to whether they are curtailing the jurisdiction of the original courts the answer to the last one is obviously no competency there are questions which have been raised constitutionality i have already told you that constitutionally they are completely valid has been held by supreme court of india several uh, a time and again in in their judgments and they have their they are constitutional as long as they are not impeding upon the jurisdiction of any of the courts theek hai clear any doubts on this okay now uh, moving on to question number 13 see it says that india and usa are large two large democracies examine the basic tenets on which two political systems are based iske andar aapko sab cheeze likhni hai you have to write about uh, you know the uh, party system इंडिया uh, के अंदर किस तरीके का पार्टी सिस्टम है वहां पे किस तरीके का पार्टी सिस्टम है इसके अंदर आपको ये भी लिखना होगा कि रूल ऑफ लॉ से फॉर एग्जांपल इन इंडिया वी हैड प्रोसीजर एस्टेब्लिश बाय लॉ अर्लियर देन वी फाइनली इंटरप्रेटेड इट टू बी अ ड्यू प्रोसेस ऑफ लॉ ओनली राइट इन यूएस इट वॉज फ्रॉम द बिगनिंग ड्यू प्रोसेस ऑफ लॉ यू हैव टू ऑल्सो टॉक अबाउट सिंस इट टॉक अबाउट टू पॉलिटिकल सिस्टम यू नो वॉट आर दिनेट्स ऑन विच दे आर बेस्ड यू वी टॉकिंग अबाउट दैट constitutions both of them are written you know they are rigid to a certain extent indian constitution being more flexible in nature whereas the us constitution being more rigid in nature very difficult to amend right then you would also be talking about so there are number of things i can <coughs> note it and now give me a second so
Yeah. So you would be writing about flexible, rigid constitution, type of government which is there in India, which is parliamentary versus presidential. Uh, you will be talking about due process of law versus you know procedure established by law, separation of powers between in, in India. It is not a very strict compartmentalization. In US, it is very strict compartmentalization when it comes to separation of powers, right? Party system, which is there in India, we have a multiple, you know, uh, party system, multi-party system, whereas they have a two-party system kind of a democracy. So those are the things which you kind of need to bring about in your answer in this. Huh? Judiciary ke case mein aap lik sakte ho. So various aspects, you know, there are different aspects in which uh, you can kind of this thing, uh, simple, very simplest of the uh, question on the uh, comparison of constitution. Next one is, how is Finance Commission of India constituted? Okay. So, in this case, you basically need to talk about Article 20, what is the composition of Finance Commission of India, what are the, comp uh, you know, who are the uh, four members which are there, the, uh, the present Finance Commission, ke mein aap ki, you know, the present Finance Commission which has been appointed, the 15th Finance Commission, which has been appointed under N.K. Singh as its chairman and so and so forth, right? And then it says that what do you know about the terms of finance of uh, uh, terms of reference of the recently constituted Finance Commission of India? In this, what you should uh, talk about is the uh, you know important provisions, uh, important terms of reference, and the ones on which some controversy is also erupted. For example, using the 2011 census data instead of the 1971 census data, right? Or the uh, thoughts on increased devolution also, right? The terms of reference also talk about specifically the impact on the fiscal situation of the union government of substantially enhanced tax devolution to the states following recommendations of the 14th Finance Commission. And it kind of reflects some kind of reluctance on part of the central government to uh, lead to more devolution, right? So they, they have kind of put it in the terms of reference that what has happened as a result of the 14th Finance Commission increased devolution formula and they need, they want the 15th Finance Commission to examine that. So that is another aspect. The third one is that it has also been given uh, terms of reference with respect to finding the ways to improve the ease of doing business in the country, right? So th that is another aspect. Also, uh, you know, how the borrowing by the states can be curtailed. So this is also another controversial aspect which has come up in the terms of reference of the 15th Finance Commission. And it has also talked about <coughs> uh, how the populist measures can be controlled and the expenditures on populist measures can be controlled. That is also one of the terms of reference of the 15th Finance Commission. Now that is also again acquired a lot of controversy. You know, what constitutes populist, what does not constitutes populist. State governments should have their own uh, prerogative in deciding what they want to spend on, what they don't want to spend on, who is the Finance Commission to tell them. So these are some of the aspects which you kind of need to bring about in your answer. Right? Discuss hai, to uske andar aap provisions, aap terms of reference important mention karoge and you would also be discussing a bit about the controversy which is surrounding this. Right? And not necessarily taking a definite stand because taking a definite stand on something like this would be very difficult. Okay? Next question, 15th, regarding panchayat system. See, this is a very good question. For first time, UPSC on panchayat, urban, local bodies, etc. has gone beyond asking what are the problems and rather asking what are the solutions. So the question is, assess the importance of panchayat system in India as a part of local government. Ye to aap sab sakte ho. Talk starts from 73rd constitutional amendment, then being the grassroots governance, preparing people for, you know, future leadership, brings democracy to the uh, people, Gram Sabha, the role of social audit, you know, how the priorities can be decided by the people, bottom-up planning exercise, bottom-up governance, all those aspects need to be brought out here, right? And you obviously need to bring out all of these things in a very structured manner. How it promotes democracy, how it uh, you know uh, fosters leadership for future, how it is leading to more bottom-up kind of democracy where people decide the priority, right? Governance is closest to the people because of that corruption is less, right? Because of that, the uh, policy making and decision making and legislation is more inclusive in nature, right? It is not elitist in nature, 
all those aspects have to be brought about that what is the importance of panchayat system in India and most importantly talk about historical aspect as well that panchayat is historically the most fundamental unit of governance in India starting from time immemorial then it says apart from government grants what sources the panchayats can look out for finan <coughs> financing developmental projects now when you see this kind of question dekho, 250 words hai. talk about the various ways in which the panchayats can raise or the various sources of funding for panchayats in India are 1, 2, 3, 4 devolution from states their own capacity it could be some kind of borrowing of money as well Right? So all of those aspects you need to mention. And then you mentioned that in as of today, panchayats are largely dependent on devolution of funds from the state governments or uh, as it says the government grants or some grants which are coming in through the devolution formula etc. from the finance commission. But these are falling short of meeting the developmental requirements of the panchayats thereby curtailing their functions significantly some of the ways in which additional resources or additional money can be raised for the functioning of the panchayats are so and so Ab iske andar best would be to give certain examples i could i could not really think and i could not really locate but there are several ex you know specific examples there are several examples where the panchayas themselves have gone about creating awareness about uh, the money which they raise through various local taxes which are applied in their area of jurisdiction. So in fact you could mention things like uh, you know uh, that you should have some kind of reasonable taxes being put on various commodities or various items within the jurisdiction of the panchayat and awareness be created amongst the uh, the citizens that why they should pay such taxes because abhi tak sabse bada jo resistance panchayats ke paas hota hai wo ye hota hai that if they impose taxes or increase taxes they are closest to the people jab modi tax badhata hai so it's very difficult for people to think that Prime Minister has done it. You try to understand it. But they can't hold Prime Minister directly accountable so easily. That's why all this politics over patrol is taking place. Because no one knows ki government, central government ke paas kitna hai, state government kitna le rahi hai. So it's very easy to, you know, pass the buck to the other thing. But when it comes to the local governance, people very clearly know that this is the person who's increased the tax. Right? So they will hold him accountable and therefore there is reluctance on part of the state on the part of the panchayats also to impose such taxes. Okay? So that is one thing which you should mention. Right? Other aspect which you should uh, mention is that in some of the states the gram panchayats have been empowered to <coughs> access loans for various projects such as public infrastructure, service deliveries, etc. Right? So that is another aspect. Another aspect which can be explored is can't Gram Panchayats borrow from financial institutions such as the banks, such as uh, some Nabad, etc. and so on and so forth. Can they not explore those kind of options for generating their revenues? Right? And also raising money from the market. Can they have some kind of panchayat bonds? Municipal bonds we already know. Can't we have panchayat bonds in this country? Right? Can't we have some kind of way to raise money from the market also for the functioning of the panchayats? So that is also something which you need to mention in your remarks. Okay? And most importantly, when you are concluding this, you should mention that financial powers are coexistent with the legislative and the functional powers which have been given to the panchayats, most importantly functional powers. Till the time they do not have functions devolved to them, how will they raise taxes on those functions? Are you getting my point? You have said that fisheries are not functions in your functions. 
तो आप फिशरीज के ऊपर टैक्स रेज कैसे करोगे देर फोर स्टेट गवर्नमेंट इट इज द रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ऑफ द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट टू आइडेंटिफाई एरिया वेर पंचायत कैन इजिली रेज टैक्सेस and devolve those areas or functions to the panchayats once the functions are devolved automatically they will get the power to raise taxes or user fee also on those particular functions theek okay? hai so that is about question number 15 uh, then is question number 16 right ha ha acha ma'am ne kar liya tha और एटींथ एटींथ नहीं किया ना एटींथ का बहुत लेट्स दिस वेरी क्विकली डिस्कस दिस सी इट सेज दैट सिटीजन चार्टर इज एन आइडियल इंस्ट्रूमेंट ऑफ ऑर्गेनाइजेशनल ट्रांसपेरेंसी एंड अकाउंटेबिलिटी बट इट हैज इट्स ओन लिमिटेशंस आइडेंटिफाई द लिमिटेशंस एंड सजेस्ट द मेजर्स फॉर ग्रेटर इफेक्टिवनेस ऑफ सिटीजन चार्टर सी अगेन आइडेंटिफाई फोर की इन दिस सिटीजन चार्टर इज एन आइडियल इंस्ट्रूमेंट फॉर transparency and accountability one second is what are the limitations and third is measures to so conclusion ke andar measures likhenge hum jahan tak transparency and accountability wale portion ki baat hai you basically need to talk about what is citizen charter what are the objectives of citizen charter in this particular in aap introduction ke andar इसको कवर कर सकते हो थोड़ा इंट्रोडक्शन इलांगेटेड होगा यू विल टॉक अबाउट वॉट इज सिटीजन चार्टर इन समर डिफाइन इट इन लाइन वॉट इज सिटीजन चार्टर हाउ डू डिफाइन सिटीजन चार्टर यस इट इज अ सेट ऑफ कमिटमेंट मेड बाय द गवर्नमेंट और एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन टू इट्स कस्टमर्स to whom it provides services to it is a, it's a commitment which i have made right it's a set of commitments and obligations that i have made to you that i will deliver you this that i will deliver you this and for this delivery this person is responsible for this delivery this person is that is what citizen charter is it is a set of commitment i have committed to you this is what citizen charter is ki agar aapko पासपोर्ट चाहिए तो पासपोर्ट के लिए इस आदमी के पास जाना होगा इसके लिए इतने दिन लगते हैं दिस इज वॉट सिटीजन चार्टर इज इट इज अट्री कमिटमेंट विच आई एम मेकिंग टू माई कस्टमर्स दैट आई विल प्रोवाइड यू दिस सर्विस आई विल प्रोवाइड यू दिस गुड इन दिस सो मच टू टाइम इन सो मच दैट इज वॉट सिटीजन चार्टर इज राइट वॉट इज दब्जेक्टिव ऑफ सिटीजन चार्टर वन इट प्रमोट ट्रांसपेरेंसी ऑब्वियसली वन आई गो टू अ गवर्नमेंट ऑफिस आई नो दैट दिस सर्विस विल बी डिलीवर्ड टू मी इन दिस मच टाइम बाई दिस पर्टिकुलर पर्सन एंड दिस इज वॉट this is what is the standard of service which i can expect so it clearly delineates standard of service and accountability is set you cannot be any longer told ki uske paas chale jao uske paas chale jao uske paas chale jao citizen charter very clearly tells ki is particular officer ki responsibility hai ye kaam so if it does not happen you hold this particular person accountable so that is the purpose of citizen charter and that's what you need to mention the philosophy of citizen charter it's called citizen charter for a reason it's a charter which i have given to the citizens it's a set of commitments which i have given to the citizen that i will abide by this theek hai now but in spite of and then you should also talk about the inception of citizen charter in india when did the citizen charter come up for first time in india and all those things and stuff and all then you should talk about limitations you should say that citizen charter has its own limitations why one in india citizen charter has not been able to achieve the desired objectives of transparency and accountability why first and foremost citizen charter banate waqt design karte waqt at the time of designing in the inception of citizen charter you did not take views and suggestions from all the concerned stakeholders very simple it was not a consultative process aapne khud se bana diya without considering the citizens and their inputs one 
second aspect so design is one second aspect is that citizen charter is not enforceable in nature by law as such it is just a set of voluntary commitment i have made if you do not have service level agreements or a service level uh, or a service act service delivery act it is useless because it is just a commitment if i do not abide by it i do not abide by it what do, what, what what can you do that second aspect the third aspect is people those who are delivering citizen charter should also be changed till the time people those who are delivering citizen charter or those who are delivering the set of commitments under citizen charter are not changed till the time processes are not changed aap idhar se udhar file ghumate raho yesterday i was talking to a friend who is in ias and he was telling ki yaar hum to red tapeism green tapeism black tapeism sab mein believe karte hain mar he had i sat in this car he had this many number of files he was taking from his home to office and he said that yaar isme na sirf ek hi file hi important thi aur sab to idhar udhar bhej denge that's the reality he said yaar ye main nahi pad sakta itni sari files wo bas idhar udhar subah baith ke unke upar sabke upar sign kar raha tha aur bol raha tha ki ye sab idhar udhar jaani hai like main to ek hi file important hai us pe urgent likh raha tha wo secretary ke paas jaani hai aur sab i don't have any botheration with where it goes right and because he says bhai main i have so much work main 50 file literally the entire car was full of files he had a uh, xuv the entire xuv was full of files okay now so people have to change there has to be a training which has to be provided if the attitude still remains to be that yahan aayega to main usko wahan bhej dunga wahan aayega to wahan bhej dunga to citizen charter is of no use right and then several other aspects of citizen charter also you know come in in terms of that if you have designed that this is the person responsible if he is not delivering that then what will be the punishment for that what will be the compensation which will be provided for that right your entire processes ha- have to uh, you know change in case of citizen charter so all those aspects have to be also kind of mentioned in this and i uh, you know i just noted down a few <coughs> another could be they are not being reviewed feedback mechanism is not there many times citizen charters are not in local languages vernacular english ke andar laga diya wahan par और सिटीजन चार्टर को सबसे कोने में छुपा के लगाते हैं नजर ही ना जाए दिखे ही नहीं तो दिखेगा नहीं तो किसी को पता भी नहीं राइट सो सबसे एकदम ऑब्सक्योर कॉर्नर ऑफ द रूम इन द गवर्नमेंट ऑफिस फाउंड एंड यू पुट द सिटीजन चार्टर देर हाँ बैंक में करते हैं वो सबसे कोने में लगाते हैं उसको छुपा के जान बूझ के उसके ऊपर कैलेंडर भी लगा देते हैं कई बार तो ठीक है सो ऑल ऑफ दीज थिंग्स एंड देन एबसेंस ऑफ लीगल बैंकिंग lack of public awareness how many people know yahan pe jitne log baithe hain unhi mein bahuton ko nahi pata citizen charter unke liye aaj pehli baar citizen charter samne aaya hai theek hai to bahar wale ka socho jo upsc ki taiyari nahi kar raha usko to waisi hi nahi pata citizen charter kya hai theek so those aspects have to be mentioned and measures for greater effectiveness see measures for greater effectiveness are you need to mention about sevottam model you need to mention about how Uh, you know business process reengineering jisko kehte hain government ke andar that has to be brought about training of the people has to be done awareness campaigns should be launched you know then service level you need to give legal backing to citizen charter some of the states punjab madhya pradesh delhi etc have already enacted service level acts service uh, delivery acts where they have said ki agar ye service nahi mili itne din mein तो इस पर्टिकुलर बंदे की सैलरी से इतने पैसे कटेंगे राइट सो दैट काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स हैव नाउ बीन यू नो इनएक्टेड एंड दैट इज व्हाट हैज टू बी डन इफ यू रियली वांट टू मेक सिटीजन चार्टर इफेक्टिव यस सिटीजन चार्टर एआरसी यस नो 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 सी आई ओके यस जस्ट टू क्लेरिफाई दैट दैट गवर्नेंस बुक बाय लक्ष्मीकांत इज द बिगेस्ट स्कैम ऑन दिस अर्थ ठीक है दैट हैज नथिंग इन इट इफ एनी वन ऑफ यू हैज ऑलरेडी बॉट इट यू वुड हैव रियलाइज्ड इट बाय नाउ वो हरे रंग की आती है ना किताब बहुत खराब किताब है मत खरीदना उसको ये कुछ नहीं है उसके अंदर सो इफ यू रियली वांट टू लर्न अबाउट एंड द बेस्ट सोर्स टू बी ऑनेस्ट इज इंटरनेट सर्च अप ऑन इंटरनेट 
There is a website called as Shodh Ganga, all of you would know. We have some really good research papers also on governance etc. there. You can find it there. Or otherwise just search up on internet. World Bank ki website pe, it is a lot of good website, uh, website uh, ki website pe, Indian Law Institute ki website pe, lot of good websites pe you will get material pertaining to this. So you should refer that and not this Lakshmi Khan governance that's wo usko laga ki yaar chalo ye meri kitab successful ho gayi hai to main dusri bhi nikal leta hu it obviously is a sham so don't buy that it's a waste of money it's a waste of time right doesn't carry anything you will find all of that information on internet there is no analysis for analysis refer the second arc reports right ha no okay, doubt yes Special leave petition में समझा दूँ अभी। See, special leave petition is basically nothing, यार। If there is a case which is lying in front of the Supreme uh, High Court of India, and I want to take it to the Supreme Court, I can take a special leave of the High Court and take that case too. So there is a petition which is filed. अगर एक case already High Court के सामने pending है, I can take it to the Supreme Court. By filing a special leave petition that I wanted to be out of this high court jurisdiction and take it to Supreme Court jurisdiction directly. That's what special leave petition. Okay, thank you.